महादेव अटोले प्लीज स्टॉप प्रेजेंटिंग गुड आफ्टरनून सर Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, sir. Welcome, sir. Welcome. Welcome, sir. Shall we start the program, sir? Yes, sir. Yes, yes, yes. You may start. Ah, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Honorable Director, Zoological Survey of India, Dr. Kailash Chandra. Joint Director, Dr. C. Raghunathan. invited and esteemed resource speakers for today's webinar on aquatic entomofaunal diversity in india uh, emeritus scientist professor k g shivaramakrishnan sir dr k subramanian officer in charge of southern regional center chennai father dr maria pakiam director entomology research institute lila college professor dr p venkateshan emeritus professor Dr Ankita Gupta senior scientist NDAR Bangalore Dr Rajappa Babu scientist Chennai SRC Chennai Dr G Soman ZSA Kolkata Dr Manpreet Singh ZSA Kolkata Dr Prabhakaran and all the invited dignitaries all the officer in charge of all 16 regional centers of ZSA participants for this webinar on behalf of director zoological survey of india i welcome you all amongst us we have many research scholars professors associate professors and distinguished personalities from various institutes colleges and universities just to start with few lines on the freshwater biology regional center it is one of the 16 regional centers of zsi which was established in the year 1979 The main objective of this center is to explore, research, and document the fauna of various freshwater ecosystems of India. Apart from this, we have also conducted studies on the limnology, on the freshwater bodies, EIA studies, revisionary works, and monographic works. It has a repository of more than forty thousand national zoological collections at Hyderabad Center. As a part of series of webinars conducted by ZSI. last month we have also conducted the webinar on fish water uh, fresh water fish diversity this webinar it is on aquatic insects which are the most diverse group of uh, fresh water system aquatic insects are distributed in almost all kinds of diverse climatic conditions in fresh water habitat i am sure this webinar will give a broad view on water insects like ephemeraptera plecoptera trichoptera beetles bugs and other groups due to limitations in the google platform uh, the the link has also been shared on youtube all the registered participants will be awarded e certificates after the submission of the feedback form at the end of the session so to start with i request uh, dr kailash chandra sir director zsi just to mention a few introduction about our director uh, i think introduction is not required but still to just add sir has about 38 years of research experience at sai dr deepa you skip it because we do have a lot of time now sir has completed about many 22 projects and 12 externally funded projects sir has published many books 64 books 127 research papers 
I do several extracts, many popular articles, and many several, several, several books. Sir is a chief editor of many scientific publications. Sir has described the three new genera and 86 new species. And uh, 19 students have completed their PhD under Sir's guidance. I am privileged to announce that Sir has been awarded with Beetle Man of India Award from Society of Biological Sciences. A uh, lot of applause and raw laurels to director from FBRC and all the regional centers of ZSI. I congratulate uh, on this platform, director, for getting the Beetle Man of Award. Congratulations, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Now, I, now I request director to present the keynote address on this. Thank you very much, Dr. Deepa Jaswal, for uh, your introductory lecture about this uh, national webinar on aquatic uh, entomophoral diversity in India. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, all our uh, resource person, including uh, our chief guest, Professor K.G. Uh, Sivaram Kastanji. Welcome, sir. Welcome. Sivaram Kastanji, welcome, sir. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, he's uh, our uh, honorable member of uh, research uh, uh, advisory committee of Geological Survey of India. I welcome uh, Father Dr. S. Maria Pakkam, who is also going to share uh, his information about the low cost diversity and their uh, management. He's a director in uh, uh, Entomology Research Institute, Loyola College. And we have uh, Dr. Uh, Professor uh, P. Venkateshan, Professor Emeritus in Geology, Loyola College, Chennai. Uh, Dr. Ankita Gupta Thank is also sir. with us as a resource yes, person sir. today. Welcome, Good madam. Welcome. Good afternoon, sir. Uh, yes, sir. From NPIR, she would be speaking about the parasitoids. Dr. Thank K. You. Subramanian, our uh, very senior scientist from ZSI. And he's also heading uh, our Southern Regional Center, Chennai, of Geological Survey of India. After uh, Professor K.G. Sivaram Krishnan, he is the leader in aquatic uh, insects in India. Dr. Deepa Jaiswal, experts on uh, aquatic beetles. Dr. R. Babu, aquatic uh, odonates, or the entire odonata. Then uh, Dr. S. Prabhakarad is there. He is working on the cockroaches. Blatoidia, and Dr. Devi Shankar from JSI headquarters she would be sharing the information about uh, the mosquito diversity in India. And Dr. Manpreet Singh Pandey, the student of Professor uh, Saini, uh, who is actually the renowned experts on the trichopteran, caddis flies. So like that, now we have uh, more than 10 resource persons with us, and we have to complete, uh, I think, all our uh, Maybe presentation by within uh, three hours. So that is a challenge for all of us. Dr. Deepa Jaiswal, it's uh, now you have to manage it and you have to give enough time to all our speakers. Yes, yes. Uh, I will not take much time, but I just I want to share about uh, our activities in JSI. As many of you are aware, that JSI is one of the premier uh, organizations in India, which has been serving to the nation for the last uh, more than 104 years. Uh, it's important is Kolkata, and uh, there are 16 regional centers throughout India. As far as the aquatic corner diversity of India is concerned, uh, we do have three regional centers in uh, uh, whole India uh, who are exclusively dedicated to study the fauna of uh, uh, freshwater ecosystem. That is uh, in Hyderabad itself, Freshwater Biology Regional Center, who has organized this uh, national webinar, and Marine. Uh, Biological Research Center that's in Chennai. Another is the actually in uh, Biology Regional Center that's in Gopalpur. Uh, so these three centers are exclusively dedicated to work on the aquatic uh, fauna of our country. So this is uh, the extent. It's not limited to these areas, but from all other uh, regional centers also, our scientists have been working on the aquatic fauna as well as aquatic insects in India. Uh, I just want to share uh, uh, some of the information with regard to this freshwater uh, 
uh, one and hours in india as uh, the fresh water ecosystem is very very important for all of us water is life so in our body also if we'll say if you compare the total weight of our body more than 99% of our body is just h2o that is the water if entire body of any of the animal or the human being a child that would become just 0.1 in the carbon form and all other uh, will get evaporated so so we are all water bubbles uh, all the animals all the human being being a, uh, one of the species of the animal kingdom homo sapiens and that's why the water is very very essential for us and these aquatic insects they play a major role uh, in balancing the ecosystems maybe at the food chain food web and there are also the indicators of the biodiversity and the quality of the life in the water uh, in recent times maybe last uh, maybe uh, more than four five decades most of our body our water bodies are getting uh, declined or their uh, even the area is also getting restricted because of the uh, unsustainable developmental activities and uh, these insects also they are also part of a uh, aquatic food web because uh, they also break down the process of organic matter and they provide the food for invertebrates as well as the vertebrates uh, of the higher uh, animals they have been found in all types of uh, uh, natural habitats across india uh, even in the antarctica and arctic regions are the aquatic uh, diversity of the fauna is available there so they are everywhere we cannot say that they are not present any of the continent in the universe i should talk about the insects uh, so there are several uh, uh, group of insects that could be divided into fresh water and the marine insects although there are many group of insects which are uh, oh, their life is uh, completing in the fresh water but there are few species uh, which are also found uh, in the marine areas in the coastal area even the asturian so still lot of work is going on and the fresh water uh, uh, insect diversity has already been uh, uh, compiled and then uh, by geological survey of india i could not say that uh, it belongs to our jdsi entire work many other scientists from the different organizations they have been working on the fresh water diversity and now we have been able to compile to how status what is the current status so that uh, database could be developed and in the future the workers on the fresh water uh, fauna diversity they may have the database and they can just do the research what are the new species related to and what are the new records in india in the marine uh, ecosystem we have very few group of insects that is aquatic bugs mostly the uh, sub family halobatni and the genus halobates have been uh, recorded but there are many other uh, species uh, pertaining to this ma- mostly in the mangrove actually then uh, salt marshes plus intertidal zones they have been recorded and they may be of the beetles and then uh, flies and there are the several species of the water bugs there are some uh, other parasitic groups like uh, mylophaga that we call as the biting lice and the anoplura that is the sucking lice they have also been recorded from the aquatic uh, our uh, water birds and the soar birds so we also consider them as uh, maybe not uh, completely they come um, complete their life cycle uh, in the water but they are also present in those uh, water birds these aquatic insects have been worked by even uh, our uh, resource uh, uh, persons who are actually the leading worker in india professor uh, uh, shivaram krishnan ji even dr uh, subramaniam has uh, published one book on the guide of the aquatic insects and who were the uh, participants if they want to learn about the aquatic diversity in india they can refer to that book it's very very interesting and guide by which they can identify at least up to the sub family even up to the generic level the that possibility is there as far as uh, the insect diversity in uh, whole world is concerned it already crossed more than 10 lakh species uh, from the whole world as we know that uh, in our uh, 
global scenario, around 1.8 million species uh, have been uh, described and named, although it has been estimated that may be possibility of the 8 million species of the all the organisms which are uh, present in the very, very conservative estimation. So there is a challenge for all of us to study and name them, then describe them, the remaining more than 6 million species. And that's why yeah. all of us have to join together to work out. And that is also one of the advantages for all the scientists and the researchers. They will be getting the credit to describe those species. Uh, JSI has already uh, compiled the information on the entire uh, freshwater uh, fauna of our country. And there's one book, Current Status of Freshwater Fauna Diversity in India, wherein uh, Freshwater Biology uh, Center has uh, compiled, and they are the major contributor for the, uh, the information, uh, wherein 9,457 species have been included. Uh, this is one of the, I think, uh, current uh, publication on entire aquatic fauna of our country. And I'm happy to say that uh, out of these species, more than 4,842 species are pertaining only to the insects. So they are all uh, aquatic insects uh, within that. Uh, so 50% of them are belonging to the insects pertaining to uh, major orders like Diptera, uh -huh. and Colyptera, and then Trichoptera, and the Hemiptera, that is aquatic bags, and Ephemeroptera, Plecoptera, Dr. Sugo, uh, oh, okay. and uh, Professor so Shuram Kastens, they are actually authority on the EPT, Ephemeroptera, Plecoptera and the Trichoptera. Uh, hundreds of publications they have uh, uh, made it for the last few decades. And uh, they have been giving a lot of training program to our uh, participants uh, as well as the researchers. I'm um, happy I think uh, many of them have also joined today. But what is more interesting, there are many other groups or uh, the major orders also. They may not be having the complete life cycle in the water but partially they are also present uh, in the aquatic systems like aquatic uh, beetles, then aquatic bugs, then there are few species of the uh, hymenopterans. Even arthropterans also have been recorded from the nearby the water streams, if you search it uh, in the bellow streams. So there is a lot of information on the insect, uh, uh, aquatic insects in India now, but still there are many gap areas, if you will go through all those uh, uh, orders of the aquatic insects as I have mentioned here, you know, the major orders. So there are many gaps, even the Ephemeroptera and then um, uh, Plecoptera and the Trichoptera. Even all those states, we do not have the enough number of species known from the various states. So those uh, uh, information are already available in the website. Uh, the publications have already been by uh, Professor Ram Kastan and uh, Dr. Sobramadiam and other colleagues who are present, even Dr. Pandey, they have made it. So those species which are recorded from entire, uh, all 10 biogeographic zones are also, they have been given in the publications. So now the challenge for all of us is uh, to, how to have the uh, synergy among all the institutions like Loyola College, they have made the MOU with JSI and they have started working. Uh, although they have uh, also uh, been working under this our supervision of our uh, late uh, Dr. Anantha Krishna, our director, and uh, he has been guiding the Loyola College. That's why they have a lot of our expertise there. And we should not forget about our Dr. Thirubalayan today, uh, who has been working for uh, several, uh, two, three decades, only on the aquatic bugs. And he was actually 13 in... Uh, Jadesai, today we are missing him, otherwise he would have been part of us. Uh, and we will always have a lot of actually uh, uh, admiration for him, and he is al always guiding for us. So, whatever the gap areas are there, we have to just see it. These uh, insects are also being eaten by the ethical group, uh, some of the tribal communities in uh, maybe northeastern region and other parts of India. and. Uh, uh, many of those insects, particularly notodictidae, or if you see their uh, species, they also sometimes bite if you are collecting them in the field. 
and uh, if you see this our larvae of the trichoparans they are very very interesting although this species will be having different cases they are maybe made of the leaves they may be of the stones so this is interesting this is very very interesting to study the aquatic insects particularly their original habitat even i uh, am um, uh, uh, sorry to inform that many of our scientists i can't say it's jsi but uh, all india they will not be able to identify some of the the species uh, whether they belong to the order blackoptera when they do the collection so those trainings are very very uh, much required for all our uh, colleagues and there are many groups of the um, flies that are also present exclusively in the uh, fresh water like chironomidi uh, species they are mostly found in the high altitude regions so still there are the gap areas and these species have been very very actually important to study this uh, as a bio indicators so you will we'll see this uh, uh, website of the central pollution control board they have made lot of our uh, tables and the criteria and then you can study and then if you put it you can understand what does the water fresh water is uh, is healthy or still there is a lot of uh, pollutants so all those things also could be carried out Uh, Dr. Subramaniam is already having one of the project. Uh, there is a long-term uh, ecological monitoring, and he would be running it, and in which also he'd be getting lot of informations. So, long-term monitoring of these uh, uh, aquatic insects also very very important for uh, all of us, and so that at least we can conserve whatever is uh, there in the aquatic uh, ecosystem. So, all of us we have to join together. Uh, it may not be only from JSI but other. Uh, Institute, colleges, universities, and uh, since we have the repository in JSI, who is interested to study those specimens, maybe type specimens or the reference collection, they may refer to JSI. Maybe Freshwater Biological Research Centre in Hyderabad, or from headquarter, or maybe Chennai Regional Centre, or any other regional centre where our scientists have been working. We have very good uh, uh, strength of the scientists who are. is closely devoted to work on the aquatic species i think more than 15 20 scientists are there they have been working continuously so it's a good uh, uh, i think major strength for all of us to study the aquatic insects and today i congratulate uh, dr uh, deepa jaiswal for taking up this particular issue and to uh, the how the dissemination of the information and i hope this uh, present webinar will be of immense help in understanding the value of uh, uh, aquatic ecosystem and their ecosystem services of aquatic insects and their direct and indirect uh, value in uh, balancing the natural uh, ecosystems as well as the awareness about the diversity and uh, conservation of uh, the species in its uh, entire ecosystem particularly the aquatic aquatic ecosystem so I, thank you very much dr uh, deepa jaiswal and all the participants at uh, this was possible thank you this is my permission to allow thank you any question to me if it is there i will be uh, happy to just uh, inform thank you dr deepa jaiswal uh, thank you so much sir uh, we are really grateful and thankful to directors of the survey of india to inaugurate the in national webinar with us Okay. Sir, this knowledgeable and excellent inaugural keynote has set a for our discussion in the forthcoming sessions. Sir, to just add it, totally we are having 765 participants in this webinar. Out of that, six participants are from international, from US, Scotland, Thailand, Kathmandu, China. Do please keep the record for all participants. Okay, and send it to him. Yes, sir. Uh, so now, uh, I request. Uh, so next, coming to the, we we'll start with the session. Uh, to start with the. So thanks everyone. I will be just joining it. Maybe uh, uh, I may be little away because I have to do some other work. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Sir. Thank you. Now, to start, let us proceed to our introductory process presentation on aquatic insects by emeritus scientist and well-known aquatic biologist, Professor K. G. Shivram Krishnan Sir, UGC yes. emeritus scientist. Sir is from the Madras Christian College. He is a retired HOD of uh, 
Madurai College, Madura College. Sir is also specialized in biosystematics, ecology, biogeography, and phytography of aquatic insects, especially the Ephemeroptera stream ecology and biomonitoring of aquatic systems through benthic microinvertebrates. Sir has published more than 90 publications in the national and international journals, four books, and many field guides. Sir has been fascinated with many awards, to mention a few like award by the Australian Development Bureau and uh, to present a paper in the International Ephemeroptera Conference in Maysville, Australia. And also is also facilitated by Radha Krishnan Award for College Teachers by Government of Tamil Nadu and many other awards. Now I request Dr. Shiv Ramakrishnan sir to enlighten the researchers with his knowledge on the aquatic insects. Please sir. Just the science this way. Uh, esteemed uh, Director, uh, Zoological Survey of India, esteemed uh, uh, additional director, as well as uh, the organizers of this seminar, headed by uh, Deepa Madam and all the participants. Good afternoon to all of you. First of all, before starting my introductory remarks, I bow down my head in veneration to the mentors, Professor Anantha Kriti and Anantha Krishnan, as well as my direct guide, Professor W. N. Peters of Florida a and University, the noble departed souls who have been instrumental to make, to stand in front of you as a student of aquatic entomology right from the early 70s of the previous century. This inspiration is due to them, exclusively due to them, as also my research guide, Professor Dr. Joe, and my mentor, Dr. Mike. With this, uh, I just pass on to justify why I am standing in front of you today to just uh, interact with you as a relic of the previous generation to some extent. I have long association with this esteemed institution, Zoological Survey of India, right from the, especially right from the time when Professor Anantha Krishna was director and established this freshwater center at that, during his tenure, if I know I had enough interaction with the very senior uh, freshwater biologists, especially K.C. Jaira, Menam sir, and so many people. And through them, I, I could just uh, understand what a dedicated uh, amount of uh, work on diversity of aquatic insects have been conducted right from the days of Dora and also right from the days of uh, great uh, contributors like uh, Runewall and other directors. And successive directors have been uh, just following their footsteps. Uh, even Dr. Alfred was a great uh, uh, specialist on Thironomies. And then uh, Dr. Vangatraman has contributed a lot to freshwater diversity. So the, all the previous uh, uh, directors consistently have encouraged this study. And what is the reason for that? Because, as all of you know, I'm not going to repeat and waste the time, but there are some, there may be some junior participants for their benefit. I just devote a minute to just highlight the significance of the study of aquatic insects, 13 orders of primary invaders and secondary invaders from freshwater to freshwater. So they all contribute, first of all, very conspicuous thing is that they are bioindicators of uh, aquatic pollution, very sensitive, especially Ephemeraptera, Precaptera, and Precaptera. And silently they are just uh, in the streams, rivers, and other things, doing a lot of ecosystem services of uh, just uh, channelizing the solar energy that is locked up in decayed leaves that are falling from the adjoining riparian vegetation and passing it on as a 
vital link in the fish food chain ultimately uh, to be incorporated in the biomass of humans of lot of uh, utilitarian value and then as indicators of habitat health and climate change as ideal objects also some of the taxa especially may flies caddis flies and stone flies and odonate also to some extent they all contribute to the enigma to solve. there is a paleoptera problem now as to the origin of uh, insects itself is very enigmatic and a lot of uh, global researches are being conducted and in tune that with that our country should also progress and then of course not to mention about the greatest significance that the vector biologists are doing uh, the study on mosquitoes and other uh, vectors of diseases so so many interesting aspects next uh, thank you so in contrast to the lot of attention as well as money that is being poured to just conserve the megafauna the silent insects aquatic insects they do not they have not uh, received as much attention as they should have been given even at the global level not to mention of our, our own country so you have got uh, i again repeat this slide is only a repetition of what i have uh, just uh, uh, highlighted to you that the biotic integrity of the lentic and lotic waters is of very pivotal importance for all of us and for that the study of aquatic insects gained lot of significance so the threats all these threats you are well aware of the global climate change habitat fragmentation degradation destruction water pollution alien species invasion and of late uh, lot of uh, plastic pollution non biodegradable waste being dumped into the aquatics and so we have to these uh, orders they gain lot of importance and uh, of course it's an introductory remark so i just uh, want to highlight to you and submit a sort of a three recommendations from what i have learned all these decades it's not the classical morpho studies that are that are only important now the next slide i'm going to just highlight how the integrative zoology has gained i mean intrusion into the study of insects also and lot of recent publications on taxonomy if it is not supported by integrative studies it loses its value not only that we have at the very there are some global scientists especially this cardozo et al and this uh, peterson all these people you know they have just uh, highlighted what are the eight sharp falls in the study of uh, any insect for that matter not to mention specially about aquatic insects of short forms pertaining to taxonomy coming under linnaean short form short falls in uh, uh, i mean deficiency of covering large biogeographical areas of biogeographical significance relation short form abundance of insects spread and then uh, prestonian short form the study of uh, ancient evolution in lineages as supported by darwinian short form and ecological aspects to be studied by eltonian hutchinsonian and behavioral aspects to be studied by timbergen short form so hereafter i am delighted to see the senior scientists here scientists here sitting here the energetic middle level scientists are also contributing a lot and much more important the budding scientists i can even give some example of the tricopter tricopterist malpreet singh you know how much has contributed to the adult uh, uh, studies of uh, tricoptera along with his friends he is a great uh, teacher 
Sahni as uh, influ- uh, just uh, uh, taught them so well that they have covered a lot following the footsteps of uh, the Canadian uh, uh, scientists who have visited and published a lot of them, a lot of uh, material. You know, in spite of it, there is a shortfall that enough attention has not been paid to the larval stages. So I just submit to those clusters of scientists who are working on uh, Trichoptera and other groups, even Plecoptera for that matter, to contribute to the study of just larval stages. Because now that molecular systematics is gaining momentum, they are not. They need not rear with us a lot of difficulty and all that. It could be just association uh, with uh, lose. Uh, I mean, using all sophisticated modern molecular tools like next generation sequencing. So, uh, uh, yeah, in a nutshell, our group also, in fact, uh, Dr. Subramaniam has been uh, a student of Professor Gadgil and with his exposure not only to the scientific aspect, but also to the community conservation ideas that even the formative state, because several years have been spent in the Institute of Indian Institute of uh, Science, he has gained a lot of wisdom, and not, not to mention that he is a the person of modern ethology, along with Dr. Tyagi, Dr. Radhakshna, and all those scientists. You know, and uh, I have the good fortune to be associated with a lot of uh, students of his type. I'm not mentioning everybody, even the younger students, they do remarkable work. The only thing is the elders should take cognizance of it and should encourage them at every step. Even an so ordinary research scholar entering now, they are having a lot of uh, talents and they publish, they publish prolifically. Perhaps the elders take much credit, but the groundwork is being done by this. So I keep on learning, not only from my seniors, from my contemporaries, from the middle level scientists, also from the budding scientists. And this acquired wisdom makes me say that for if we, have, we should not stop only at the study of a limited stage, life stages, namely adults, because the larval uh, you know, mayflies, larval stoneflies, larval caddies flies, they do lot of very important work. They are microhabitat specialists. This uh, gives an idea. Even yesterday, Dr. Malpreet has published a, a review of a particular philo, philopotamide order, you know, family. So like that, they, they are very dynamic workers, even in ephemera Pira. Some of my own students, uh, uh, director of zoological, present director has encouraged it, uh, them to give a position. And just, uh, they have all joined now the, as faculty members. And during that tenure in the, Zoological survey, they have done a lot of uh, very good work. I congratulate every one of them. And finally, I would like to emphasize that integrative taxonomy is very essential, which incorporates molecular aspects, besides morphological aspects, as also behavioral, ecophysiological, uh, and then a biogeographical, and then phylogeographic analysis, everything. And that kind of study alone, that's the current of Indian Institute of Science is now, and his students, battalion of students are doing remarkable work, especially on centipedes and other things. And uh, we aquatic entomologists have, em- have to emulate that global standard work and should progress well. Next, I just want to wind up with uh, three recommendations now. This slide only summarizes what all I have presented so far in a quintessential fa- fashion. You read it yourself. Now, I, res- I just request the director as well as the joint director and the team of uh, Zoological Survey of India, Fraternity of Scientists, to just pay attention to Three aspects, especially this is oriented towards my submission to Director Zoological Survey of India because that organization has invited me today. First, 
first re as a request to just uh, uh, form a forum of aquatic entomologists, assembly, assembling even senior scientists like Dr. Venkateshan, who is equally a veteran in hemiptera predator prey inter interrelationships, and done a lot of overseas work in, the over in, in, in France and other countries. And uh, fortunately, this assemblage consists of a lot of talented scientists. I want the director to take this opportunity to form a forum of aquatic entomologists first. Then, next to what is, Director Han himself has highlighted to you how many voluble volumes of uh, uh, freshwater and uh, faunal diversity has been published by Zoological Survey. The next volume should can be an edited value, the edited volume by the director and his group on uh, conservation shortfalls for every group, one chapter can be devoted and the specialists can just contribute a lot as to the scenario that is prevailing in India so that the global uh, fraternity, uh, scientific fraternity can, up, can appreciate what, uh, at what uh, positive step we are taking towards uh, averting the shortfalls. Finally, uh, the director said that a lot of very good long-time projects are just uh, being conducted. Even my own colleague, uh, Dr. Subramanian, is uh, just uh, launching a project just a few days back. It will be for a period of uh, around five years at the beginning. And uh, at this point, I make a request to him through Director of Zoological Survey of India to contact the global scientists, namely, I mean, Cardoso from Finland, Leather from UK, Samways from South Africa, New from Australia. They are just formulating a database which is incompatible with uh, the exercise of uh, IUCN regarding um, uh, this, the threat categories, you know, they are working out that also can be incorporated. And if this format is followed by our country, it will be compatible with the global database so that it will be highly productive globally also. So we can think globally and act locally. Following that step, if that format can be accommodated in such major projects that are going to be launched by Zoological Survey of India, and all the scientists as well as our knowledge also will gain global importance. This is my third submission. So in a nutshell, I repeat, just uh, I have three recommendations to offer in this introductory uh, remarks. And I hope our director of Zoological Survey of India will take this and uh, try to just uh, execute whichever is worthwhile for the benefit of zoological survey. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much uh, for your inputs and uh, three very, very important recommendations given by you. We'll certainly take up all these uh, inputs from you. And uh, I just uh, ask Dr. Subramaniam to uh, take up the issue. Then we can just uh, go ahead for the suggestions. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was very nice uh, our uh, keynote address on aquatic insect diversity of India. Thank you. Thank you, Subramaniam, sir. Thank you, Dr. Shiv Ramakrishnan, sir, for a wonderful presentation. And uh, we are very thankful for accepting our invitation. In spite of your schedule and also due to prevailing pandemic condition, you were able to guide us, sir. Really, we are very thankful to you, sir. Uh, coming to the next in continuation with uh, aquatic insects, I request Dr. Subramanian. Email the journal. Other regional center to present his topic on aquatic insects with special reference to Ephemeroptera and Plecoptera. Uh, thank you, Dr. Yeah. Dupa. Yeah, just to start with Dr. Subramanian, uh, 
His area of research it is systematics, biogeography, community ecology of ordinates, ephemeroptera and aquatic hemiptera, geographic information system and biodiversity database. He has published more than 185 publications in the national and international journals, authored eight books, and uh, Sir is also a member of uh, many societies. Sir has also been awarded by DST, SCRC Young Scientist Award, Ashoka Trust for Research in Ecology and Environment, Department of Biotechnology PDF Fellowship, Qualified Gate, Qualified UGC CSI Net. Sir has also been work, uh, Proficiency Prize for Zoology from the Government Victoria College. Now I request Dr. Subramanian to present on aquatic insects with special reference to Ephemeroptera and Plecoptera. Uh, thank you, Dr. Deepa. And I thank all the uh, dignitaries and directors at the SA for giving me an opportunity to share my uh, knowledge on, uh, very little knowledge on aquatic insects, especially on Ephemeroptera and Trichoptera. So I'm restricting my talk to Ephemeroptera and Trichoptera, sorry, Ephemeroptera and Plecoptera, because there are other experts who will be talking on other aquatic insects. So, if you know, if you know that freshwater ecosystems is only very small uh, proportion of the global ecosystems, only 0.3 percentage of the uh, available fresh freshwater is utilized by different organisms, including uh, human beings. The rest of the freshwater is either as, is locked up either as water or as a ice, so which is not used by uh, other organisms. Only if you look at the proportion of the living beings in freshwater, it is much higher than what is found in terrestrial to the area of extent. So only 0.3 percentage of the <coughs> available uh, habitat is utilized by all freshwater organisms from protozoa to mammals. So if you look at the freshwater biodiversity of India, as uh, already uh, a director mentioned, we have, the ZSI have documented more than uh, 9,000 species of uh, freshwater organisms from India. And of that, more than 50 percentage is insects. So nearly uh, 5,000 species of insects are already recorded, and every day new species are being described and uh, discovered. So that this database is continuously being updated. And still, we don't have much information on several uh, freshwater groups. Like, for example, um, there are uh, Orthoptera, which are semi-aquatic, or Blattoria, which are semi-aquatic. We don't know. Okay. Uh, our presentation is. Uh did you start to open the presentation? Yes, yes. It is not visible. Not visible. Just uh, okay, okay. One minute. I'll just uh, redo it. One second. I'll just. Yes, yes. Is it visible now? Uh, yes, yes, it is yes. visible. Yes. Okay. So, as uh, so, so the global in, uh, freshwater biodiversity of uh, uh, Indian freshwaters is very well documented, and that is have compiled the faunal resources of freshwater biodiversity. Of that, fifty percent they just is insects. And if you look at the, uh, there are 13 insect orders which are uh, in aquatic. If you look at, there are several orders for which we don't have much information. Say, for example, we don't have much information on uh, semi-aquatic orthopterans or semi-aquatic blackodia, which are present, or even aquatic hymenoptera. We don't have very much much information. I hope Angida will be talking more about it. But still, we are having less information. But uh, there are very, very interesting groups like the Megaloptera or Neuroptera, where the information is lacking, as uh, the Professor Sudhamushan has already mentioned you. That you look at is insects essentially evolved in uh, uh, aquatic or semi-aquatic stage. And uh, insects which we are, we are going to talk about today, that is mayflies and stoneflies, are very ancient. So they are late Permian or Carboniferous in origin. And these two orders, especially the mayflies and stoneflies, are very interesting because the mayflies are called Paleoptera. And the stoneflies are the one of the oldest neoptera. So if you look at their morphology, you will realize why they are called as Paleoptera and Neoptera, because the way they can fold their wings. So the mayflies, they cannot fold their wings over their back. So they just keep it uh, vertically folded over their back. 
but are the cobra can hold their wings over their back so this is a lot of evolutionary advantages that we can talk much later but just a simple that of infinite insect models as uh, <coughs> sir was mentioning the origin of these insects especially the what we see the uh, mayflies or stoneflies they all have very ancient origin and many of the lineages can be traced back to the Gondwana when all these land masses were together and we share a lot of common similarity with the other part of the world like especially the sri lanka or madagascar or africa or america because of this ancient gondwanian connection but when the indian subcontinent started moving towards uh, and eurasian and mark they both want to be also carried a lot of fauna with it with the gondwan in elements it carried as an island it carried along with it and th- those relics you can see in southern western ghats as well but when indian landmass uh, collided with the eurasian plate lot of faunal elements started colonizing from the other neighboring land masses especially from eurasia and also from africa much later and that is how the fauna of india got originated it is a combination of gondwanian elements and in incursions from the uh, paleartic elements and the migratory elements from the african and indo malayan regions so you can see all the combinations in a community especially if you see the northeastern fauna especially the fauna of sikkim you can see all the elements coming together and you have different habitats so where can you see all these may flies and stone flies you see in all these uh, uh, beautiful landscape these are high altitude rivers in himalaya or even very fast flowing hill streams you can see them you can see them in waterfalls uh, you can especially you can see them small cascades in western ghats clear and polluted waters you can see them some species have colonized especially may flies are colonized in paddy fields you can't see uh, stone flies in paddy fields but may flies definitely you can see in paddy fields few species are there then you can see in lakes here also you can see some may flies and what are the elements that govern the distribution of these species one is that the stream order as you may be aware the streams are classified based on their origin and topography into orders like you have the stream most of the stream in origin they are called first order streams then two first order streams join together form second order and two second order form third order and fourth order and so on so forth so the this order the stream order denotes the first is the gradient of the stream and the amount of energy that is discharged into it the amount of the kind of landscape it has it is going through so it has lot of ecological meaning the stream order has lot of ecological meaning and the community also respond to the what are the different stream orders and how they uh, what are the species found in different stream orders so there is another um, very well known concept in stream ecology is river continuum concept so i am not going to go detailed about it essentially it talks about that there is a predictable change in community structure as the stream starts from the first order to the uh, upper reaches to downstream so there is a change in the uh, species composition of all groups from the uh, zoobenthos to macrobenthos to fishes is essentially because the kind of energy that is being uh, received by the stream so in the headwaters that is in first order stream it is mostly the allochthonous uh, that is that is the energy that is organic matter that is coming from neighboring landscape and as the stream grows it is mostly the a photosynthesis based energy system to this the entire community changes and responds so why these things are important is that they have several linkages so both uh, upper linkages and down linkages all these root macro benthos have linkages both towards large predatory fishes and other vertebrates and also have a linkages with zooplankton so they are in, coming in between the zooplankton's microbes and to the large predatory fishes and they are very important in the food chain as of the any wetland ecosystem so how to collect these things so you can collect by simple uh, net in the what in uh, in a slow flowing stream you can use small d net you can use to collect these ones and you can use in fast flowing stream there is something called kick net sampling so you can use kick net sampling to collect uh, may flies and stone flies or to collect adults you can use light traps you can use light traps to collect adults because they get attracted to these mercury vapor lamp and 
Like if you look at this, this is a uh, picture of adult mayfly just emerged. So I'll tell about why this. I'm not saying this is not fully adult. This is Sabimago. I am coming to it. So world over, we have more than 3,000 species. People are still discovering several new species. They have evolved about 290 million years old. And there are 400 genera in 42 families. So it's very diverse in terms of family. And in Oriental region, we have about 390 species. And in India, about 170 to 180 species are described. So again, we are still describing new species. Several new species are continuously being described. So the species list is going on. So we are not reached with asymptote test. So this is the, the top one is a picture of the larva or the larval. So I'm coming to it later. So the life cycle is very interesting because the adult mayfly, it's called ephemeroptera because it has a very short lifespan. Ephemeral is a means a, a, a temporary. So they complete their life cycle in a very, very short life cycle. Uh, maybe a few hours to few days. Adults are non-feeding, adults they don't feed and most of the energy they acquire is through larval stages. So, adults, female lay eggs in water, they are always lay eggs in water and the larval larva grows. So, the larval duration is uh, varies from uh, species to species. So, most of our tropical species, they complete the life cycle in a uh, few months time and they have multi volatile species. So, they have several uh, life cycles in a com uh, complete, but some species, especially species living in cold waters or in high altitude have are either, either univolatine or they complete the life cycle in more than one year. So they grow in uh, water. When they grow, they are they feed on fine particulate organic matter. It is called FPOM. So mostly
the Lokasta. Uh, just we, we see the recent times how India was affected during the time of COVID and even before COVID-19. The present day, the invasion area of a desert locust covers about 30 million square kilometers, which covers nearly uh, 64 countries. You can find the Northwest and the East, Afri East African countries, Arabian, Pennsylvania, and Southern Republic of uh, Earthswile, Iran, Afghanistan, the Indian subcontinent. In Rajasthan, as of May 26th in India, locusts have already wiped out more than 5 lakhs hectares of crops. That is the worst affected states as per the ministry. Gujarat too has been battling locust infestation for more than 5 months now. Madhya Pradesh, locust swamps have been spotted 16 out of 252 districts. <clears throat> You find that many districts of the northern part of India was badly affected by this locust. And we know the basic scientific classification of a locust. You find the kingdom Animalia and Phyla Arthropoda and the class Insect and Arthropetra Zawada and Sapoda Calcifera. And we know what's a basic uh, scientific classification. Uh, there are six super families under suborder called Calcifera, and there are six super families under suborder called Encifera. And we know the appearance of grasshopper, uh, which are, which are uh, uh, the grasshoppers are small winged insects with the large back legs. And grasshoppers are in many in colors, like brown and green. There are different types of color in morphological differences, the color differences you can see. And in India, uh, 18,000 species are known to science throughout the world. More than 1,750 species <laughs> are from India. And Archidae are the predominant family of grasshoppers that shows the maximum diversity of comprising uh, 10,000 of the entire 11,000 species of suborder sub called the Calcifera all over the world. Sir, please uh, play a slideshow. Yeah, not see. Not playing slides. Okay, I'm okay. Maybe I stop. Do you see the slide? Sir, do you see the slide? Yes, but not in slideshow. Yes, yes, sir. I'm doing the slide. Yes, sir. Now it's visible. Okay. Okay. So the appearance we find the grasshoppers are small wind inside with backlets, and you find the different colors. And there are 18,000 species in the world, and 1,750 species have been recorded from India. And you find there's a rich diversity of uh, grasshoppers. In particular, where do they live? The habitat, where you find the grasshoppers are found on all continents except Antarctica. Grasshoppers live everywhere, particularly meadows, fields, and hedges. They prepare dry, open habitats with a lot of grasses and other low plants. So wherever there is a green cover, you find the presence of grasshopper. What is the basic behavioral differences in terms of grasshoppers and locust? Grasshoppers being as a primarily solitary creatures, they live alone. They live alone. So primary is a solitary creatures throughout their lives and coming together only for reproduction. So they come together for reproduction. But when there is, uh, uh, when the species is threatened, uh, during feeding, they move one place to the other, maintain for longer duration. They don't normally migrate from one uh, state to other states or one country to the other. Uh, they live always uh, separately. Whereas a locust mostly occurring in groups in which they forage, bask, and, and roast. As migratory species, often shifting from one area to the next in search of food to fly over long distance. So they are able to fly for thousands of kilometers. Sir, slide not seen. Uh, slide not seen? Yes, sir. 
I'm not seeing, sir. Uh, for me, it moves. The sharing is on window. Okay, so you are not able to see the slides. Uh, slide is visible, but you can able to see the slide. Sir, visible, sir, visible. Okay. Some okay. people may not be able to see this, but please yes, go ahead. It is visible, sir. Please continue, sir. Uh, thank you. So you continue, sir. Know, in the locust breeding seasons, you find that there are three important seasons for breeding. That's a winter breeding, spring breeding, summer breeding. But in India, we find the summer breeding is the only season where you see the locust or the grasshopper start breeding very much. In Pakistan, spring and summer are two seasons are common. And we know when the November to December is a winter breeding season, and January to June is a spring breeding season, and July to October for summer breeding season. This is a basic life cycle of a locust. To understand the diversity of locust, to control the uh, breeding or the control or manage the locust, we need to understand its own life cycle, biological life cycle. So you find the egg, which takes a 10 to 65 days to hatch, and uh, they uh, become a uh, uh, non-flying nymph, which is known as harbor, that takes place 24 to 95 days. There are five instars of chemical pesticide. And we find the flying adult, which lives for uh, 2.5 to 5 months. So that is the uh, duration they, they live as an adult. So you find here, there are two important phases in locust. One is solitary phase and gregarious phase, which I told you before. Solitary phase means the individuals are inactive. And the individual locusts live as a scattered one, not living as a group animals. Whereas in gregarious, you find it's very active, very active and remain together and breed rapidly and form swamps. As swamps, you find uh, 40, to, uh, 40 to 80 uh, lakhs of uh, insects are grouped together. They occupy hundreds of acres of land. And you find uh, basically there are uh, different colors you can identify at different stages, in particular gregarious hopper, which is greenish in color. Okay, that's uh, immature. That's another stage called immature gregarious adults uh, that looks a uh, pinkish in color, pink in color. The matured gregarious adult looks yellowish in color. So these are the basic different color of a locust at different stages of life. And you find in the world, 10 most important species of locust in the world. People are terrified after Corona. And when this insect comes, they completely damage the green cover. Not only the crop that we use for our benefits, but also it damages the green trees and smaller plants, ornamental plants, agricultural crops. Maria, sir, any problem from there, sir? No, connection lost, I think. Connection lost, sir. I think, shall we continue with the next presentation? Otherwise? I think you can just make up to Dr. Maria Bhagim and ask him.
We are trying to contact uh, Dr. Maria. I think he lost the connectivity there. Can we resume? Now, are you see he resuming? Yes, yes. He is trying. Uh, I, I think some connection problem at uh, Adha Maria, sir. So I think we'll continue with the next presentation. Uh, by the time, sir, we'll also join after this. Uh, now, I uh, invite uh, Dr. Professor Venkateshan, Associate Professor in Zoology. Now, currently, sir is working as a founder and administrator for website and YouTube for NEET coaching and principal for Shri Academy for Paramedical Education, Chennai. Professor Venkateshan sir's area of research, it is biocontrol of vector mosquitoes with special reference to the water bugs, Diplonicus rusticus. Published about, and I request uh, Dr. Venkateshan to present today's tea of water bugs. Good evening, everyone. <laughs> yes, sir. Please can before, before I could make my presentation, my homage to my uh, beloved uh, late research guide, Professor Raghunath Rao, the veteran aquatic entomologist in 1950s from Loyola College, and my evergreen mentor, Dr. Abhidranath from University of California till today. And also my gratitude to Dr. Kailash, the director of the Zai, for inviting me as a resource person, Dr. Deepa, hmm? the organizer, Dr. Prabhakar, who proposed to me for this program. And let's not forget uh, Dr. Senraj from Visitor Site Chennai, who is the country link between all three of us. And uh, let us go to the presentation. Is it visible? Madam, is it visible? Not visible, sir, not visible. Oh, one, one second. Yes, sir. No? No, sir, no. No. Oh. Uh, now it is visible, sir. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. You can put it on the slideshow, sir. Yeah, yeah. I am trying. Okay. My field of presentation today, it will not waste the time of others. Let me go directly to the topic. Future shock to biodiversity of aquatic insects. I am Professor Venkatesan from Lyra College. And uh, when you talk about the aquatic bugs, they come under the order Hemiptera. We will see a brief classification of aquatic and semi-aquatic hemipterans. We got a suborder, suborder 1, homoptera, and I am interested in the second one, suborder heteroptera, which are truly the aquatic in nature. Now, this water bugs come under 15 families, and uh, we call them as Corixidae, Lacoridae, Geridae, then Delostomatidae, Pleidae, Hydrometridae, Nipidae, Notanectidae, Hebridae, Gelastochoridae, Saldidae, Mesovillidae, and Octaridae, Villidae, Macrovillidae. Of this particularly, Saldidae, Gelastochoridae, Octaridae, Hebridae are not much recorded, I think, or we can say almost nil from Indian water bodies. And I am very glad that uh, more than 12 families, uh, we can say more than 10 families have been worked out by my research scholars. So at the outset, I thank all my research scholars who have been supporting me to go ahead with all these more than 10 to 11 families. Now, I divide my talk today into four uh, sections. Let me start from the reverse end, that is uh, future shock to the biodiversity of water bugs. Let me start with the water bugs as the part one. So these insects occupy 
the freshwater ecosystem lentic like a pond or a lake or the lotic the river or the stream and they become an important components in the food web of these habitats now they are of economic importance because as dr kgs referred in his introductory remark that uh, they are becoming uh, the important uh, controlling agents for the vector mosquitoes that spread the human diseases like malaria dengue and so on when we take these water bugs what are salient features there are many but i am going to just refer here four important features raptorial four limb we will see later pierce mouth parts paralyzing secretions from the salivary glands and the visual acuity visual perception most of these water bugs are polyphagous so they feed on various types of food items in the freshwater bodies and they are mostly carnivorous a few are herbivorous like corixids and most of them are reported to be generalist predators that is they can go for any type of prey available in the water the body so that they survive but very particularly the belastomini bugs are specialist predators because they feed only on the larval forms of certain types of uh, food items why we say these aquatic bugs as a principal converters because there are some like the corixids as i told you they feed on the plant material at the same time they will be the food of the fishes as i told you before there are four important parameters as arthropod armor essential for the predatory adaptations let us see the first one the raptorial four like raptorial means the method to capture any food item so it is with a lock that becomes from the tarsus tip of the leg forearm to the of the femur so here we get an angle between the femur and the tibia there is an angle and this angle decides what can be the maximum prey size that it can hold capture and feed on that second is the piercing mouth parts which are so powerful even it can pierce a fish the skin of the fish and it can suck the blood third is visual acuity the compound is so prominent as in the case of the butterfly their visual perception is very high even to the extent of nearly 4 to 7 kilometers you can see and when we talk about these as cages referred that they are the excellent bio agent we come across classical biological control which is not in practice today with reference to water bug why after pimental worked 1990s he brought out a new association method or the approach where you come across the tendency of predator to co-evolve some degree of balance with their host coming to the second part of my presentation the various types of water bugs i may not show all but a few of them before that we should know that nearly 3% of the insect population right from odonates up to the heteropterans or aquatic in existence as the our uh, esteemed director referred that there is a form even in sea water like halobates the halobates is a uh, insect which can be seen in the sea and the washed waters so they are widely distributed every part of the globe let us take a dragonfly the two parts in life cycle the naiad and that of the adult the naiad can be seen as uh, the growing stage in the freshwater body what about the adults they are terrestrial flyers so is only really partial in aquatic existence whereas if we take heteropterans they are truly aquatic just to show a few few families like a nepidae we can subdivide into the sub family nepine and radatinae then take the last one blastomatinae we can subdivide into three sub family howartinae and blastomatinae and so on so in the blastomatinae itself we have nearly don't have any howartinae in indian waters of course we know lithosebenae has a very important uh, example called lithosaurus we will see the photograph later on when we take these uh, five uh, the genera of blastomatinae the most prominent one in india is that of diplonicus what we refer as a belostoma it is not in indian water it is wrongly spelled in most of the textbooks because we have belostoma only in northern part of us 
Let us see a few examples. First of all, what is scorpion? Lack of trusses because it has a scorpion like appearance. Second one, Ranatra, what is stick insect? The third one, toe biter, diplonicus. Why do say toe biter? As Dr. Kailash, the director said, when we go in search of the water body for aquatic insects with the barefoot, there is a chance this uh, diplonicus may bite our uh, toe and uh, we may have severe pain because of the uh, secretion they make from salivary glands. The pain may last even for about an hour. And so we say the toe biter. Very peculiar feature of diplonicus is the male will be sitting idle over uh, a twig of uh, hydrilla or cara. The female comes and lays the eggs on his back. So now we call the male as the caretaker of the eggs. Nearly 200 eggs or, or so may be on the dorsum of the bug. And we call such a bug as the encumbered bug. So this the encumbered bug will quietly go to undisturbed corners in the freshwater body till the eclosion of the eggs. You can see the nymph emerging from the egg. Once the eclosion happens fully, then the male will kick off the egg pad from its back with the help of the hind legs and have a happy swimming. Next is uh, we have just to show how we have a cluster of these uh, diplonicus because each diplonicus may measure hardly about uh, 15 to 16 millimeters. Okay, that's the maximum size. Opposite to this is the lithosaurus, the giant water bug. It is about 5 to 6 centimeters in length. This is the largest insect in class Insecta. And this is more seasonal in distribution, particularly during the monsoon. It gets attracted to the light, fluorescent lights. That's why we say as electric light bug. But it has a great affinity for paddy field. Why? Because for uh, the breeding and for uh, laying of the eggs. So it will just bring it, deposit the eggs over them like a bunch of grapes and they keep it as a emergent vegetation so that the eggs can breathe the atmospheric air. That is the uniqueness of uh, water bugs. Next is water strider. Jerry is very common in pond. It uh, can breathe the atmospheric air. That is the uniqueness of uh, water bugs. Next is water strider. Jerry is very common in pond, in a uh, well. At the domestic well, if you just peep and see, you will see something darting on the surface. Nothing but jerry's. A water strider and the peculiarity is they just walk on their uh, they tarsus. The whole body is not touching the water at all. This is a small sized uh, water bug, was a water feeder, Mesovelia, and measures about 5 millimeter length. Just it looks like a the jerry's. This is a Corexa, the water boatman, the water measurer, Hydrometra. You can see that uh, it walks over the uh, surface of the water and the legs are so thin. Let us see what are the importance of these uh, water bugs economically. You can see as a Bellostoma species in uh, northern part of America, see the Nepomarpha, the Jeromarpha. Nepomarpha where we get Lacotrophus and Renatra. Jeromarpha we get uh, Hydrometra and that of uh, the Jerez. Bellostomatis, we have the Diplonicus, and of course, giant water bug, the Lithocerus, and the top, the Curexidae. These are very often referred as the biocontrol agents. And when we talk about biocontrol of these bugs, they are very effective. How it is possible? Because multi species predator character. They maintain inter species relationship with the different predatory strategies among themselves. That is uniqueness that becomes a separate chapter to talk about. But I will go to the third part of my topic as the habitat structure, what we say bio. So far we have seen diversity of water bugs. Now we will go into the bio or the biological aspects of the diversity with reference to habitat. When we say freshwater bodies, we have a lot of micro environments right from the surface area. We can say that uh, the larvae will come and settle down on the surface, we say noisten. And uh, you may come across, they also dwell between the rootlets of the water hyacinth. They can be seen, the runner will be just going and inserting the eggs in the twigs of uh, 
the submerged vegetation like hydella they are so very micro specific in the distribution as well as in the breeding habits then we can see just uh, a stratification of this heteroptera in a pond surface area we come across gerets column dweller ranatred the stick insect what a stick insect they will use the entire water column for their dwelling bottom dweller the nipids what about all strata that is belostomatids that is unique of the diplonicus where i have studied for more than 25 years now coming to the loss of this habitat so every habitat has its own potency we are losing it day by day how if we take fresh water bodies the bodies are shrinking slowly or we are losing it or it is drying up because of continuous drought we don't get rain sometime for more than one of two years and also due to human settlement let us see a few example standing example a very famous pond in chennai known as chetpet chetpet pond very dear to keel park medical college and hospital and uh, if you see the pond in 1930s 1940s 1950s so beautiful and it is also taken for entertainment those days they used to have boating in that uh, beautiful pond what is today filled with iconic water hyacinth now this pond is to be owned by the research institute of government of tamil nadu they take lot of efforts to remove these hyacinth periodically now they are kept excellent and they avoid that any involvement of uh, public there is no sporting today i think they are going to begin shortly in bodhi i to the one of top 10 colleges in india layala college chennai the most famous one and it started somewhere in 1930s at that time this whole 105 acres of land was nothing but a lake filled with water to a depth of about a foot the then jesuit management met the governor of uh, Tamil Nadu or Chennai in those days and requested them to give this land for higher education. The then governor was uh, smiling. Are you going to think about uh, a building in a lake? Then they, he said, okay, take it. That's so how they registered it. And uh, when it was started, you would say beautiful main building of Lila College. And also you can see an excellent water body as you enter the main gate of the college. When? in 1930s 40s 50s 60s even in 70s when i entered the royal college as a faculty member there was number of water bodies in the college the backyard had excellent paddy field there was a permanent uh, pond i used to collect all these insects only from that pond what about today of course we have that uh, building of course there are a lot of uh, gardens beautifully and there is a necessity that drives mankind to go for a more number of uh, buildings and to give uh, uh, higher education to the best to the mankind and in that context we are compelled to lose some vital freshwater bodies let us see one more valluvar kottam the very famous one in nungabak what about 1905 500 acres of uh, land beautiful uh, paddy field coconut uh, farm banyan trees number of uh, wells for people to bail water excellent paddy fields what about today nothing but they have a beautiful thiruvalluvar uh, heritage building with a radam there and of course it is needed but at the same time we replace or we displace the beautiful fresh water body that is the last portion of my talk the future shock why we say shock here because it shocked to me the after 40 years of work with uh, these water insects and i remember dr thirumalai an excellent person from izetta side and used to have a long discussion with me whenever i go to izetta izetta side to discuss some aspects of the water but very good worker at a very high knowledge i think uh, it is a loss to izetta side because of the uh, demise of dr thirumalai what is the fate of water bugs today first one the loss of potential food web and the sequential food chain is lost between your know, fish and that of uh, the algae there the chain is broken second one i can say that a day may come when we say 
we will bring this as a rare data book as endangered species as we say today and the rhinoceros and uh, the hippopotamus a yeah, day may come when diplodocus may be an endangered species or our future generation may see the specimen only in the museum i think uh, i should uh, request our director dr kailash to uplift the museum particularly the freshwater uh, insects in hyderabad and a day may come even we can't say maybe after 200 or 500 years afterward just like we say today jurassic park animated forms may be visualized by the after uh, children or the youth of tomorrow and above all we are losing the biocontrol agent slowly we are losing it because of this we may have high mosquito menace and uh, we have to live with the vector borne diseases as we are facing today the covid 19 which is unavoidable a day may come then man may be suffering a lot cause and effect the last aspect of uh, the future shock mainly due to the spoilage of fresh water bodies with the pesticides abnormal growth of uh, water hyacinth the inflow of effluent from industries what is the effect first one shrinkage of uh, the population of water bodies in size the loss of biodiversity and the trophic categorization with this i thank everyone for patient listening thank you thank you professor venkatesh sir thank you we will definitely uh, pass on this recommendation to our director to have a repository of aquatic insects and we will try to also develop a museum of aquatic insects at the hyderabad sir thank you so much thank you uh, yeah now uh, dr maria bhakyam sir is uh, online now uh, just because of the network issue sir was not able to present now i request uh, father maria bhakyam to continue with the presentation sir are you available sir father maria Ma'am, you need to unmute your uh, phone microphone. Okay, okay, yeah, yeah. Thank you, thank you so much. Okay. Yeah, ma'am. Uh, okay, so we will continue with your presentation. Sure, ma'am. Sure, ma'am. Yeah, yeah. Dr. Ankita Gupta should be presenting on uh, parasitoids of aquatic insects. Madam is a senior scientist at ICAR, National Bureau of Agriculture and Insect Resources, Bangalore. Madam is expertise in biosystematic diversity and ecology of parasitic wasps. Uh, Dr. Ankita has described 57 new species from India, French Union Island, China and Iran. Published more than 97 reviewed research papers, four monographs, two from India and two from Oriental region China and one international catalog. Dr. Ankita also has been awarded with the ICR Institute Award of Excellence for Scientific Category, Dr. Swami Appan Award for Outstanding Contribution in Biosystematics of Biocontrol Agents from Society for Biocontrol Advancement, Dr. B. Vasanthraj David Young Scientist Award, Professor T. N. Anandakrishnan Foundation Senior Scientist Award. So now I request Dr. Ankita to present. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, is my screen uh, visible? Yeah, screen is visible. Yeah, you can present now. 
Yeah, ma'am. Uh, respected organizers, uh, respected director, John director, Dr. Raghunathan sir, uh, Dr. Deepa ma'am, Dr. Prabhakaran, uh, respected resource persons here, scientists and dear viewers. Uh, uh, the topic which has been given to me by the organizers is parasitoids of aquatic insects and I would like to thank them because uh, uh, first I was apprehensive to deal with it because I haven't uh, really worked into it. But then after reviewing the literature, I realized how important it is to emphasize such topics which have not been yet covered. So going ahead with my presentation, um, uh, this is going to be the outline of my presentation. I'll be talking about the global species uh, diversity and distribution, the mechanism of parasitism and escape, then comparison of the diversity of the very little Indian species which are known uh, versus the global species and the missing links for the futuristic globe, uh, goals so that we can plan ahead. So dealing with the species diversity, uh, aquatic hymenoptera, if we take, a lot more is covered from holarctic and oriental regions. But this is likely an artifact caused uh, by the poor sampling or the lack of knowledge from the other reasons. And in uh, Bennett in 2008 have enlisted around 150 species from 11 families, which are recognized as aquatic. But now then... Uh, are you coming back? Yes, ma'am, I have opened. I'm moving the slides. Is it not visible? Yeah, it's not visible, ma'am. Not visible, yeah. Okay, how do I? I will. Present now. Uh, click on the present now. Uh, ma'am, I have already clicked. Achha, one second, you just go to that present now slot. I can't. Yeah, ma'am. Right? Uh, ma'am, it's already present now only for me. I don't know what's the problem. One minute, oh, let me try. restart the presentation, ma'am. Please, yeah, yeah. Is it visible now, ma'am? No, not yet. Not yet, yet. ma'am. Is it visible now? No, no. I think present now. Then go to the windows. Your PPT is already open there, yes, ma'am. It is already opened. Ma'am, there is a one. Uh, on the right side of the computer, there is one uh, logo present yeah. now. Yeah, present now, then window, I am going. Yeah, then I am going here, I am sharing. Is it visible? No, no. no. Yes, no, yes. No. Now yes. start. Yeah, yeah. Is it visible? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, 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 as I was talking that Bennett in 2008 have uh, enlisted some 150 species from 11 families, which are recognized and aquatic. But then uh, these account to only 0.13% of the total described species, which he has taken into account in 2008 based on the database, as well as the few regions which have been, dis uh, which have been explored that time. So if we look into the distribution pattern of the aquatic hymenoptera, except Antarctica, you can see they are scattered all over the globe. With can also you minimize a little bit of the screen. I think uh, it is just showing half of the screen. Okay. Now, ma'am, it's, no, it's, it's okay. No, it's okay. No, it's Okay, then um, uh, you can see that many of the species are localized in the Nearctic and the Neotropical region and the Paleartic region, but very less is known from the Australasian, Oriental, and uh, the Pacific and the other ocean islands. So if you go into the groups which are responsible for parasitism in the aquatic uh, ecosystem, there are six major superfamilies, uh, Chalcidoidea, Ichnomonoidea, Platygastroidea, Proctotropoidea, Sinipoidia and Vespoidia. The key players are Ichnomonoidia, uh, basically the Ichnomonids and the Briconids. In Chalcidoidia group, they, the major coverage is by the Trichogrammatids and the Mimarids, which are primarily the egg parasitoids. And very bare examples you can see for Eulophids and Tyromalids. Good number of examples from Platygastrids and Diaprids from Proctotropoidia, and hardly few examples from Pom pilots. So I'll talk about the mechanism of parasitism and the escape and the behavior uh, moving towards uh, the taxa which are covered. So as you all know, the semi-aquatic species of Plicoptera, Odoneta, Ephemeroptera, Chironomidae from Diptera, Trichoptera and Coleoptera, they coat their eggs with gelatinous secretion spumaline, uh, which is produced by the accessory reproductive glands. Now it is said that because of these cues which is produced 
uh, very specific and they are very specific to the host. These cues which are produced by the host, the parasitoids get attracted even it is underwater. But then the points to ponder here are why some of the groups for any of for them, none of the parasitoids from one particular stage is, stage is known. Like if you go into Ephemeroptera, mayflies, we do not have any account of egg parasitism. So if is it because of they are avoiding, they are escaping the parasitism or we have not yet doc documented. So even globally, this particular thing is not yet clear. So uh, when we start with, with they have so they have developed morphological adaptations and it is said that they are not evolved uh, based on ancestors. They have evolved based on the habitat which they have chosen uh, as in due course of their development and many species have relatively, they have developed dense pubescence to trap air and elongate tarsal claws to grip the substrate underwater. If we come into the behavioral strategies, uh, when in the pattern of evolution we see there are three primarily basic strategies which they follow. One is the phoretic lifestyle localized to many genera, the swimming capabilities which have been developed time and again for many of the taxa and the chemical cues which are very important which are emitted by the water plants and which help these egg parasitoids to locate the eggs. So if I start with groups, uh, the specific ones which have developed swimming capabilities are the mymarids and the trico grammatids which target the odonates and the uh, various uh, water beetles and di uh, gerids and diatisids which are attracted like these egg parasitoids get attracted to them but then there are other groups like chrysomalids donacini where uh, the aquatic leaf beetles they get attracted by the terpenoids which are produced by the host and in turn they are responsible to attract parasitism so this is step by step. I'm going to talk about the escape mechanism and the, how they proliferate. So this is one of the example. Uh, since none of the examples are there from India, so I'm going to take global examples. This is an Afrotropical species of spider, which is known to have intertidal habitat. This is formidabilis. And uh, this... Uh, the, here, the important thing is that this particular uh, predatory spider, which is predatory to crustaceans, is prone to attack at two stages, like they can be attacked by the pompilates or they can be attacked by cilionids in the X stage. So even though they are able to escape because of their intertidal habitat, they are able to escape the predatory uh, spider hunting bats, uh, pom pilots. But then be because the egg is the vulnerable and the sedentary stage, they get parasitized by Echrodesis lamurile, which is a cilionid. And many workers have given a deep account of it. So then when they are in, inside the ecosystem, they, they and the neighboring eggs, they try to capture and in turn, they try to proliferate inside. So they are responsible in directly and indirectly to maintain the equilibrium of that aquatic ecosystem because they protect the crustaceans from the spiders, which are responsible for breakdown of the seaweeds. And in turn, they help in releasing the nutrients back to the sea. This is an interesting uh, phenomenon of manipulation of the host behavior. How smart are parasitoids in manipulating their host behavior? This is an excellent example of an ichneumonid recliner velis nelsoni, which targets the nervous system of the spider, the cyclosa. So on the right side of my screen, you can see on the top, this is uh, the a web of unparasitized spy spider, and this is the deformed web of a parasitized spider. So what these wasps do, they <coughs> let they lay the eggs on the spider abdomen. Then the egg hatches, the wasp enters the spider hemolymph, they inject the substances which are responsible to uh, alter the web building behavior. And why do they alter the web building behavior is that they need a very uh, sturdy and uh, strong uh, web to hold their cocoon so that they can 
move ahead with their life cycle so this has been worked by many people and this takasuka group and all have published a lot of papers on this then yet another example of manipulation of host behavior by a group of workers close at all multiple papers you can see where a beautiful interaction of an another ichneumonid polysphincter group is there which targets the cyclosa spider through inoculation of psychotropic chemicals by the vas blava to produce resistant webs so now if you see here there are series of events the uh, vas lands on the web this is a normal web it tries to uh, capture the spider then it it stings the spider in the mouth finally it oviposits on the abdomen of the spider there it starts growing into the larval stages finally this is the uh, final larval which is formed and the cocoon and the altered web because they need a sturdy web to hold on their cocoon to continue with their life cycle the most interesting behavior which i found was forasy and uh, unfortunately there is no uh, illustrated documentation or even any kind of documentation which i found in, in the indian literature so this has been accounted uh, from taiwan north america and south america these particular uh, group of trichogrammatids hydrophyllita they they target three families there are many examples uh, calopterygidae synogrionidae and lestidae with many examples so i i'm going to talk about one which i found very interesting from taiwan hydrophyllata emperors and the target host was solodesmus mandarinus mandarinus as you can see these uh, wasps they'll follow at the back of the abdomen of uh, the damsel fly and they'll follow until the damsel fly is ready for oviposition so that they can hit the eggs and parasitize them at the exact that particular time so this is a very uh, well documented study which has been uh, studied abroad but then in india we unfortunately we do not have any such examples to show then another beautiful uh, way of uh, representation of uh, parasitized uh, host uh, you can see uh, already the trichoptera prepupi and pupi they are most beautiful in nature because of their structure what they have but then this particular wasp has used that as a powerful tool to move ahead with its life cycle uh, life cycle you can see agrotypus has 16 species from the paleartic and oriental region basically these are ectoparasitic idiobionts of trichoptera prepupi and pupi which target the families georidae odontoceridae and unidae now how they go ahead with their uh, life cycle the wasp it will swim on the swarm over the streams in spring they mate then the female crawls down upon on a stem or it searches a stone where it finds a caddis fly larva the female wasp oviposits their egg inside the host case this is the inactive stage so the wasp is very smart enough to choose the most inactive stage and here till here they are not going to kill the host but then they try to uh, Uh, use the host for its own development until it spins a cocoon this is the time when it kills the host and it produces its own spectacular respiratory filament now this is a very important uh, uh, morphological character which you can see only in the parasitized trichoptera prepupi or the pupi because since the host is almost dead the parasitoid needs a continuous water flow to move ahead with its life cycle so it develops a respiratory filament. element and it will be present only in the parasitized cases later on the parasitoid will overwinter in the trichoptera cases and finally it will emerge and then go to the neighboring one so uh, these are uh, then the one example which i found in which little bit of biology was there from india was by sinu et al in 2007 where an another ichneumonid lytochila uh, it dives inside the water as you know in the rice uh, the pupil uh, case of the case worm will be somewhere submerged in the water or it will be on the edge so it's the case worm paropinex tegnalis so they just wait and they locate the uh, their target and then the wasp dives and it has been noted that up to 90 seconds they can stay inside the water to uh, and probably that is the time when they are using it for parasitization
then these are some of the relations now here i would like to tell though they are known globally but from india they had no 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 i didn't find any way where they have been connected so usually they are latrumeroidia the trichogametids they have been found associated with gerids and the uh, parasitoid groups of odonates are anagrus aprostocetus prestwichia polynema and megaloptera usually they get parasitized by multiple trichogamma species but then all these are known globally though all these genera i have only picked the ones the species which are present in india but then we do not have a host range of aquatic insect the host range is there but then it is for the terrestrial ones so now i'm going to take the family wise distribution of for uh, the parasitoids of uh, aquatic insects these are for the trichogametid family these are the three predominant genera which are responsible for parasitism centrobiopsis hydrophyllita as i discussed before and prestwichia now amongst these three these two are not present in india or have not been documented prestwichia is very much documented from india but then there are only two species which are known and only for one species which is uh, has a distribution range in orissa and west uh, bengal they target hemipterans and isops uh, so the host range which is mentioned in the databases and isops bovary and plea frontalis though i didn't get a illustrated account of that and there is yet another species of prestwichia recently discovered in 2009 by dr hayat but then it does not have a host range but globally the prestwichia aquatica is the most well studied a uh, parasitoid group which targets the egg range of notonecta renatra dytiscus and pilobius so possibly here we need to look into that we might also have this host range but then we have to look into it coming to the next family platygastridi Uh, these are known as the beautiful swimming wasps and uh, typhoidites are the species altogether there are 16 species which are known globally and dr rajnam rajmona have described a couple of them i found in literature these are basically parasitoids of water striders uh, the the gerids so uh, these swimming wasps they use their uh, wings as a mode of polypyrin uh, <laughs> You're a relative, right? Uh, hello. <laughs> Shall I continue? <laughs> I don't hello. Yeah, yeah. Right. So I'm not. Yeah. Okay. So next family is a mimaridae and agrus, and they usually target odonate cynagrionidae, the agrion uh, genus. Then uh, the beautiful uh, mimarid wasp polynema. So, uh, if you see in literature, uh, Dr. John, uh, Sir John Lubbock, has given a published account of uh, this uh, mimarid polynema and a trichogrammatid, both with aquatic habitats, and uh, they have shown the mechanism of. Uh, parasitism like polynema uh, mimarid uses its wings for uh, uh, the movement inside the water while prestwichia the trichogrammatid uses its legs for movement inside water the the brachonids are usually the terrestrial ones but then adamon this is uh, mostly in the afrotropical region which are responsible for uh, parasitism of aquatic uh, flies belonging to uh, genus hydrilla and they are also reported to swim so these uh, this is a, a example of uh, the world's one of the worst invasive weed uh, uh hydrilla verticillata and uh, for them uh, in many places importation has been done for hydrilla the fly the ephydrid fly which is responsible for its uh, biological classical biological control but then Uh, this uh, in this case there is an anomaly this canosa in this particular case where it is uh, harmful and considered as undesirable however the same group of taxa when it targets the same group of uh, the same group of taxa hydrilla in pest it is economically important so this is a anomaly based on the based on our choice then a uh, very uh, prolific uh, aquatic hymenopterans uh, the diprid group and here i'll give you a classic example of host range expansion so this particular wasp columbiana trichopria columbiana it targets the hydrilla the dipteran pest now when in florida uh, for the control of uh, 
the weed hydrilla they imported a uh, hydrilla pakistani and hydrilla balciniusi they realized that this particular wasp trichropia columbiana expanded its host range and they moved ahead to the uh, the the ones which were imported so this negatively impacted the population densities of hydrilla which was a biological classical biological control agent especially in certain marginal habitats and when the parasite toid population densities are high this is again a beautiful example of host dislocation and perhaps the only one where uh, a illustrated account is given for a pompylid wasp which targets the non insect group so they drag the water dwelling spider prey over the water and since because of the weight of the spider they cannot carry it so what they do is that they use the buoyancy of the spider body which permits the wasp to swim along on the water surface then they move goes to the edge there the they dislocate the host from the water to the land for oviposition and they continue their life cycle these are the different ichneumonids which have been globally known to uh, target their uh, pest cremastus for uh, the control of uh, aquatic moth nymphula then medofron many species for control of dytisid water beetle and cyclorhephus dipteran pupae and attractor sepentontis for dipteran uh, pupae this is again an ichneumonid so as i told in the beginning of the slide that ichneumonids are predominant aquatic wasps globally which are known but none of them or very few hardly any are known from india this again is an example from japan apsilops japonicus which targets uh, neuschonibia testalis uh, testacialis in a wa yellow water lily ecosystem then again there is one yet another species but not reported from india so i come to the last families three families left and uh, as you can see eulophids aprostocetus mestocharis and tetras gigas these two are very much present in india on variety of uh, host range of terrestrial insects but then though they are known from odonates from other regions especially the neartic and the united states of america they are not known from india same the tiromallets both these genera are not known from india but they target the aquatic insects the coleopterans as well as the dipterans Hello, ma'am. Please unmute. Hello. Doctor Ankita, it's not audible. Okay, ma'am. Is it audible now? No, yeah, yeah. Now it is clear. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 ma'am. Okay, one minute. Now my slide has gone somewhere. <laughs> it is visible here. Okay, okay. So. Um, one minute ma'am i'll just resume to presenting mm, i don't know where my slides are gone okay i think so i'm almost on the end of my the end of my presentation and uh, i would just like to say that from india uh, we have only few species known wherever the species are known we do not have the host range or the host behavior and uh, i think so this is an important group which Hello, ma'am. Yeah, is it? Uh, yeah. Now, now, now it is coming, Ankita. You can continue. Yeah. So, ma'am, what I I am on the end end of my presentation, and uh, I would request for any of the uh, questions if. if they are for me so basically this is an unstudied group with lot more opportunities which can which we can encash in future yeah hello uh dr ankita uh i think it is almost done no yes ma'am i'm finished yeah, yeah.
Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Sita, for a wonderful thank presentation. Thank and you, it's a very interesting topic on parasitoids of aquatic insects. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, we are very, very thankful. Now, we will continue with uh, Dr. Maria Vakyam, sir. Sir, uh, Father Maria, sir, are you are able to hear me, sir? Ma'am, is it visible? Yes, it is visible. Okay, I'm sharing. Yes, yes, please, sir. Okay, just a minute, we use. Oh. Just a minute, I'm, I'm on that view. Finger can you? Yes, we do. So for you. Hello? Hello? Yes, yes, sir. You are audible. Okay. Uh, Ma'am, is it, is it my slide is visible? Yes, it is visible. Please continue. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I'm extremely sorry for the delay. I was because of a lack of network or I don't know what is the technical error. I came to the institute to present on low-cost diversity and management. So we find here in the present day, uh, what happens in the world, in particular India, and how much damage is being caused in Rajasthan, Gujarat, Madhya Pradesh, UP, because of locust and its diversity. And we have seen the scientific classification and what it is and how uh, this uh, locust is coming from which family and which order. I hope you have seen this slide before. Now we see here over 18,000 species are known to science throughout the world. Uh, more than 1,750 species have been recorded in India, but we are aware of it. And grasshoppers are found in all continent except Antarctica. And grasshoppers live everywhere, particularly meadows, meadow, uh, fields, and hedges. And they prepare dry, open habitats with lots of grass and other low, and low, low plants. And what is the basic behavioral differences between grasshoppers and locusts? And grasshoppers are being as a primarily solitary creatures throughout their lives, coming together only for reproduction. All that they live uh, separately and only for reproduction, they come together. And maintaining the same habitat for longer period, period of time. They don't travel from one country to the other, one state to the other. And they move because it is being threatened or because of feeding, it moves one place to the other. What is the other difference between the locust in terms of behavior, mostly occurring in groups in which they forage, bask, and roost? As migratory species, often shifting from Hello, is my voice is audible? The voice is audible, sir. Oh, I don't know. It gets off. I find automatically uh, mine is getting off. That was the issue I find. So. No problem, sir. You can continue, sir. Okay. Okay. I think it is not audible now. Dr. Maria, sir, it is not audible. The mic is off. So why it gets automatically gets off? 
someone named basant is frequently muting maria someone someone is muting that was the reason because i'm speaking someone named basant from the participant is frequently muting maria okay okay we will just unblock basant then please block yeah please maria sir you can continue sir okay thank you sorry for the delay and we find the uh, the life cycle of locust primarily you find eggs and nymphs and flying adults and you find the egg will, to become hatched out it takes 10 to 65 days and when there are nymph or hopper which is known as a uh, hopper non flying nymph it takes 24 to 95 days so you find all these days there are five instars and second and third nymph or uh, hopper is the uh, is the stage where they feed more plant crops as a result that is the period we can apply for chemical pesticide or biological pesticide to control a locust otherwise it becomes very active and it is able to damage they grow in lakhs and millions are able to travel for thousands of kilometers and occupies thousands of acres of land and you find the flying adult which lives for maximum of 5 months okay so you find there are two important stages solitary phase and gregarious phase the solitary phase is inactive and individual locust uh, lives scattered in gregarious phase very active they remain together and breed very rapidly and they form swarms that is the basic behavioral uh, differences of these two phases solitary phase and gregarious phase uh, my voice is my voice is audible ma'am sir it is audible sir Please thank continue. you thank you so you find that there are three important stages in locust and uh, gregarious hopper which is uh, greenish in color and you find the immature gregarious adult uh, which we call the sexually immature they look pinkish in color whereas the mature gregarious adults they look yellow yellowish in color so in india uh, you find 10 important species of locust in the world and the desert locust bombay locust migratory locust italian locust and mauritian red brown south american australian and tree locust so these are the 10 popular locust which it damages very much in india there are four species of locust in india as a desert locust migratory bombay and tree locust among these four uh, species of locust you find the desert locust are the one which damages the most important insect pest in india as well as in the intercontinental context and the history of locust invasion in india you find historically the desert locust always been a major threat to the well being of a human person not only human people the all animal those are depending on green cover because once they damage the thousands of acres of land green cover is being damaged there is no food for other animals there is no proper oxygen immediately the food chain is being broken when there is a broken when there is a breakage taking place in the food web or food chain there's a lot of ecological imbalances so the desert locust is mentioned as a curse to mankind in ancient times ancient writings in particular uh, all the testament bible in the bible you find in 37 places they mention about how the locust damages or creates a starvation in the human society and also holy quran in two places they mention about the negative impact of a, a locust so the magnitude of the damage and loss caused by the locust is very gigantic beyond imagination as they have been caused the starvation due to its polyphagous feeder you know monophagous and polyphagous it's able to feed hundreds of crops at a time and day and night they become very voracious very active they feed uh, more leaves as a result where an uh, an average a small locust swarm uh, eats as much as food one day about 10 elephants 25 camels or 2005 people would eat just imagine when there are hundreds of swamps which consist in millions of uh, millions of uh, uh, locust the locust do cause damage to the leaves flowers fruits and shoots and the stems it's able to damage 
So this is the picture uh, about in the Bible, how the king Pharaoh is arresting the people and keeping us as slaves for a hundred of them. They will send, uh, he will send us uh, what we call the locust to create a starvation. As a result, the king Pharaoh was changed. So we can see the uh, function of locust in the Bible, which was mentioned uh, thousands of years before. And you find the grasshoppers are great of economic importance. There are constant threat to uh, crops, uh, pulses, vegetables, orchids, and grasslands and forest plantations, of which are present all over the world. Our grasshoppers cause significant damage to the tree seedlings, agriculture crops, and are considered as a oligofagus. So based on the host preferences, it, uh, it, these locusts are classified into different groups, different names. And we need to understand how they play an important role in the food chain. They play a central role in food webs as they are mostly primary herbivores. They consume only green plants. They don't cause any diseases to particular animals, particular human person, and constitute an abundant food resource for other groups, such as lizards, raptors, and birds. And grasshoppers have a significant importance in the economy of grasslands ecosystem be important primary herbivores and contributing to the diet of many animals. Locust invasion on India, Pakistan, and Iran. You find here, grasshoppers have attacked several districts of India. The swamps of locusts have invaded vast uh, swaths of land in India since April 11, 2020. So they entered uh, several districts of Rajasthan via Pakistan province. So a few days later, they entered the neighboring states, Madhya Pradesh. So how do we manage the locust? It's very, very difficult to eradicate. I can say it is impossible to eradicate this locust species because of a huge number, because of the breeding, the reproduction that takes place. But how to manage it? Locust could be managed because each species has its own purpose for existence. We can't eradicate. Once we eradicate any species that becomes, that creates a imbalance in the ecosystem. So the gardeners can use a particular chemicals called the harborel, uh, arborel around the borders of their garden before these grasshoppers arrive. So they can use it as before they arrive, they can use this best, these chemicals. Uh, Nolo bait and the samospore uh, contain the most effective organic solution for locust control. That's also commonly used for managing locusts and garden barrier is being applied. There's also cultural uh, control method, plant and cultivate trap crops uh, surrounding the uh, growing areas you are trying to protect from grasshopper, particular locust in person. So we find here how to manage locust at national level. The state governments are to be informed about the probable locust threat well in time. That's very, very important monitoring, even day and night, keeping a special uh, people. And their own field functionaries and officers are kept to be ready to cope with the situation. Anytime when there is an invasion of a uh, uh, locust swamp, the officials must be ready at, at any point of time. A uh, training program for state functionaries and others are uh, organized and meetings of officials and uh, uh, officers are held for planning the survey and control strategy. And we need to have a joint collaborative effort between countries like Pakistan, India, and Afghanistan, Iran, and uh, other continent. We can have a collaboration, collaborative effort. And procurement of pesticide to maintain a buffer stock and continue conducting a uh, pollen estate test for the staff members, those who are engaged in locust control, to see any adverse effects are being caused because of chemical pesticide. Then LWO, that's a locust warning organization, monitors the global ecological conditions and locust situation in regions. National locust situation is also well monitored and we continue to monitor periodically and provision of locust emergency fund as per the situation as we are facing today, COVID-19, the coronavirus infections, 
uh, people are our country is spending so much of money in terms of monitoring and curing in the same way this is another natural disaster caused by locusts we need to have an emergency fund to manage the situation because it affects millions of plants and the life of animals and human persons and provision of standby aircrafts helicopters for control operation if swarms being arrived and locust management and state level what we can do four important points that i like to say to report locust information to locust warning organizations so always we need to update what we are doing what is the situation i if you are able to identify in tamil nadu krishnagiri they are able to see a so small type, different types of lo- grasshopper or locust immediately they reported to the government the scientist from tamil nadu agriculture university and other places they went and observed they find it is a national it is a, a native variety uh, not it is not a locust to provide second one to provide assistance in form of vehicles manpower during locust campaign to conduct survey and surveillance and control of locust in crop areas and to create awareness among public and farmers about locust so not only the scientists are aware the government is aware but the public people have to be educated through this like social media tv or newspapers the farmers are field training has to be given to all groups of people so that it is well monitored because people the farmers and women they are the environment particular crops and you find what are the active involvement of locust uh, management in particular through science the scientific training first one to conduct research study on various aspects of biology ecology and behavior of locust and grasshoppers second one to study and evaluate the different chemical and biological pesticides against the locust and grasshoppers in lab conditions as well as the field condition third one to evaluate this will be the last point to evaluate and evolve new techniques for control and monitoring of locust and grasshoppers so thank you so much uh, for your listening and sorry for the interruptions that happened uh, during my presentation and once again i thank the organizer of the zoological survey of india for giving a wonderful chance to be part of your team and to present today thank you uh, thank you dr maria sir for a wonderful presentation on the locust management and diversity uh, now coming to the next presentation Uh, it is by dr rajappa babu senior scientist at the southern regional center chennai dr rajappa babu hmm. dr rajappa babu is available is there rajappa babu dr subramanian Hello. Hello. Yeah, Doctor Raman. Yes. Yeah, Doctor Babu is there. Yes, yes, I'm Babu. Yes, yes, Doctor Babu. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So, Doctor no. Rajendra Babu is a senior scientist at SRC Chennai, ZSI Chennai. Uh, his area of uh, interest it is entomology, especially taxonomy of odonates. Doctor Babu has published more than 50 national and national publications. Now, I request Doctor Rajendra Babu to present a lecture on. Uh, diversity of odonates thank you madam thank you madam respected director sir our director kailash chandra sir and our joint director dr raghunathan sir officer in charge fprc deepa madam officer in charge of src dr subramanian sir and officer in charge of different regional centers senior scientists colleagues and dear friends today i am going to present a lecture on diversity of dumbsurges and dragonflies in india Dragonflies are the primitive group of insects and have first appeared about 250 million, 220 million years ago in the Dr. part. Of the are you yes. presenting the PPT? Yeah, yeah, I am presenting PPT. Sir. It is not visible. One minute, one minute, PPT is not visible. One minute, one minute. One second, I will come again. Yes, yes. No 
Hello, is it one? Hello? Hello? Uh, PPT is uh, not visible, Subbu. I think alternate uh, that uh, file has to be opened. It is open. It is not showing. Uh, one second, one second. Yeah, yeah. There is some issue once again. Yeah, yeah, no problem. Is it visible now? Uh, yes. Okay. Yes, it is coming. Yes, yes, it is visible. Okay. So, Waternet is a primitive group of insects and Avia first appeared about 220 million years ago in the Carboniferous age. The Waternet is popular known as dragonflies and dragonflies. They are the one of the key components of the freshwater ecosystem. They move near water bodies or breed near water and lay eggs in the water. They are, they are antibiotic insects. The adults are terrestrial, larvae are aquatic. The presence of dragonflies and dragonflies are maybe taken as an indication of good ecosystem and quality. The insects are evolved about 320, 390 million years ago, and this the dragonflies are uh, appeared about 250 million years ago. The, the, the evidence from the fossil records, record from the uh, European countries. So why to study dragonflies? They are key component of food web and easy to sample. They are food for several vertebrates and invertebrates. They are biological studies and also distinct habit preference. They are indicators of environment pollution and stress. They are predators of aquatic animals and even fishlings and also biocontrol agents. They are where, where you have to sample the Dragonflies. They are generally found at or near freshwater, although some species roam widely and may be found far from their breeding sites. The distribution of various groups and species of Wardenata is highly variable. Some genera and species are widespread, while others are highly local in their distribution. Some families are restricted to cool streams or rivers, others to ponds or still clear waters, and some to marshy places. The greatest numbers of species are found at sites of that offer a wide variety of Microhabitats, though dragonflies tend to be much more sensitive to pollution than our dragonflies. Habitat includes spring, seeds, ephemeral ponds, large rivers, small streams, water swamps, and wetlands. In lakes, diverse shoreland vegetation often provides habitat for many species of water Some species have very specific habitat requirements. Where do we find all found dragon water Rivers, streams, ponds, Perennial lakes, agricultural fields, forests, wetlands, the majestic or sands, especially found in the Western Ghats, and also you can found in the cities that are swarming some pantala flowers. And they will come to feed on the minute dependent flies around the fig trees. You can see this from the slide the uh, dragonflies feeding on the dipterian flies. That are, what are the main characteristics of dragonflies and dragonflies? They are two pair of things in similar or dissimilar in size and have a dark mouth or spear stigma. They have that tip of huge wing. They have long and slender abdomen, large ears, very large compound end, and the small ear like antenna. This is the external morphology of dragonflies. They have a body divided into three parts head, thorax, and abdomen. This is the head, the head, the head consists of Blood tags, occiput, and this major part of the earth is occupied by the eyes. These are the main character considering taxonomically, the each and every part is important. This is dentary of bumpy term flies. This dental is species species specific. And in the things of a flies, they are two pair of things that both means uh wing and eye wings are similar in shape and size. The wings of Tagalophae, these four and the items are dissimilar in shape and size. This 
optimal annual abundance. This annual abundance are species specific. See, if it is in eukaryotic genus, there are different species of there different species having a different kinds of annual abundances. Life history. Most of your travel wise life is spent in the larva 15 times depending on altitude and the latitude. Larva development varies from a common one to or two years to as many as six years. During last install, the nymph crawls out of the water and molds one last time and emerging prince watch skin as an adult with functional wings. Unlike butterflies and beetles, dragonflies and dumbbells do not have an intermediate pupil stage before becoming an adult. Because of this, Water are said to be a hemi metamorphosis. See, in this, in this picture, you can see the fully grown nymph becomes restless and trees feeding on eventually, such a suitable plant, and it crawls out of the water, settling down and well clear the surface. Eventually, the skin splits along the Please do not mute the mic. Participants, please do not disturb the speakers. Once again, just unmute your mic. Yes, yes, madam. Yeah, yeah, you are continuing, Dr. Babu? Yeah, yeah, I am continuing, continuing. Yes, yes, please continue, sir. So, comes under oil poison, there are two types of oil poison. That is endopathic oil poison and exopathic oil poison. In endopathic oil poison, the female will lay her eggs on a emerging plant in the water. So, so, let's see, let's slide. This is not moving. Let's slide. Hmm. One minute. Yeah. But it is visible, state is visible. It is coming, yes. Uh, yeah. You can continue. The female will lay erection on an emerging plant in the water. So, this is exopathic oil poison. It is uh, anosopterin or just drop the eggs in the water that the male is guarding the female. So, this is life cycle of dragonflies of picture uh, illustration. The female will lay in the other aquatic emerging plants. The larva is emerge and it will stay between that is that uh, life stages difference from minimum six months to three years. It very depends upon the species. And after the development, that uh, limbs will be growling and uh, hanging on the some aquatic vegetation and adult will emerge and uh, adult will develop and this is the life cycle of dragonfly. So that is some predator parasites, this golden tarlet that is still aurora infested with some mites. Some also of these uh, predators are bee eaters feeding on your dragonfly. Some other predators are robber flies, that is diphtherian flies feeding on neurothemistulia, that is uh, uh, dragonflies. And other, some kind of spiders also the predator of water nets. 
So it's some kind of coming to global diversity. So globally, there is around 27 families are known. In India, only nine families. Globally, there are about 6,332 species are known. In India, only 496 species are known. There are is the order order that is divided into three suborders. One is Dioptera, and another one is Dioptera. Another one is third one is Anesoptera. So comes comes like that is suborder Dioptera. Their wings both four and nine inches are similar in shape. Eyes are well separated, and abdomen is slender. Male male inferior animal one is Pyrrhid. This comes under family Cynoglidae. This Families only found in the diverse aquatic habitats and 62 species under 60, 12 genera are known from India. And the family platycid is exclusively found in the forested instincts only. So there are 16 species under 3 genera are known from India. Family lactic nimidae found in bushes near aquatic habitats and some genera restrict to the forested instincts. 57 species under 15 genera record from our Indian limits. Some center family single state only restricted to mountain and some mountain streams of Himalayas, only found in the Himalayan regions. There are seven species under one genera is known from India. Some family listed is found in diverse aquatic habitats. There are 21 species belong to five genera are known from India. Some center family characters today restricted to only forest streams. There are nine species under six genera were recorded from India. Family Chlorocypidae only restricted to forest streams and only found in the forested high altitude streams. There are 23 species belong to eight genera are reported from India. Family Euphidae only restricted to high altitude forest streams and the 17 species comes under 15 genera are known from India. Family Phylogangidae found along the banks of only mountain trees, only one species known from Meghalaya. And comes under suborder Anaisal Dioptera, the suborder possesses a character's linking of the two other orders, that is Zyloptera and Anaisoptera. Only one family is globally known. The, the distribution is restricted to high altitude forest streams and breach in waterfalls. Only one species found in the Himalayan region of West Bengal. Comes under suborder Anaisoptera, there are dragonflies, their hind wings are larger and differently shaped than four rings. Single inferior only appendages. The family Gompida found in diverse aquatic habitats and many of them breed in forested streams and rivers. The Indian fauna are presented by 89 species under 30 genera. Family Blorogompida found in high altitude forest streams. Eight species under three genera are known from India. Family Ashtide found in marshes, ponds, and lakes is widespread. Family and 15 species belong to 13 genera or known from India. Family Cordelegastide only found in the western and uh, eastern Himalaya and fly above the tree canopy, breed in torrential streams. Only nine species belong to three genera are reported from India. Family Cordelegastide, most of species are restricted to mountain regions, breeds in torrential streams. Only two species under two genera are known from India, only found in peninsula and eastern India. Family Lipilide is found in wide variety of aquatic habitats, breed in puddles, ponds, marshes, rivers, domestic tourist tanks and aquarium. There are about 89 species under 40 genera are known from India. Family Macromidae found over in torrential streams and water, waterfall flowing through Evergreen forest. Few species are found in plains and breed in weedy ponds, tanks, deep pools of these streams. There are 18 species belonging to two genera are known from India. Another, another your two genera, they are uh, insect, their genera insect as it is because the broader relationships are unknown. That's why they are not assigned to any family. They are found flying over torrential mountain streams and open forest patches on mountain tops about 200 feet, restricted to the western parts and eastern Himalaya only. There are about 15 species under two genera are recorded from India. Comes under high diversity. High diversity is restricted to southern western parts, eastern Himalaya, western Himalaya, and Andaman and Nicobar Islands. Western Gulf and Eastern New World have 191 and 256 species respectively. High diversity is found in hill streams, forested river in habitats, and most of the intensities are restricted to this habitat. Habitats like ponds, lakes, bottom, mosses, irrigation canals, and paddy fields have common and widespread species. There are about 186 taxa belonging to 69 genera or endemic to India, 
highest endemism found in the western ghats there are about 80 78 species are exclusively found in the western ghats within the western ghats high endemism is found in mountains south of kurg in karnataka in himalaya high endemism is found in khasi hills and darjeeling in himalaya species of platinumidae platycicidae and gombe are highly diverse and with many endemics thus Recent studies conducted in Eastern Himalaya and Peninsular India demonstrate that the ordinary fauna of subcontinent is threatened due to anthropogenic activities such as habitat destruction, agricultural expansion, pesticide and industrial pollution. Currently, IUCN red list categorizes two endangered, fifteen vulnerable, and eight near threatened species from India. What is the importance of ordinates? Ordinates are a good friends of man because, especially the people of tropical countries, because the dragonflies and damselflies. They got as a beneficial insect because they are carnivores throughout their life, mostly feeding on small insects such as mosquitoes, termites, ants, moths, aphids, blood sucking flies, etc. Larvae feeds on mosquito larvae and other soft-bodied aquatic invertebrates. The presence of dragonflies and damselflies may be taken as a good indication of ecosystem quality, and also they are free for fishes, frogs, and birds. Ordinates have a significant role in the wetland food chain. Thank you, Your Honour. Hello. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rajapa Babu, for a wonderful presentation on the diversity of ordinates. Thank Now, you. yeah. So next, uh, moving to aquatic beetles. Uh, I'm going to present that. Um, Here it is. Present. Is present now? Yes, ma'am. No, it is coming like that. No. राजन डायवर्सिटी ऑफ वॉटर बीटल इन इंडिया coming to this uh, presentation uh, i have just included uh, the role of zsi in freshwater ecosystem conservation then a note on aquatic beetles collection and preservation key to the families for identification major aquatic suborders families and the conclusion coming to the role of zsi in freshwater ecosystem conservation uh, zsi is uh, developing the baseline information on the faunal diversity of water bodies in the form of an inventory of various fauna the scientists of zsi have conducted extensive field surveys and described many new species of different faunal groups and many number of publications have come out on the freshwater system fauna of india memoirs occasional papers numerous research articles have been published on wetland fauna of india like chilka renuka ujjaini asan sambar and many other wetlands of national importance coming to the freshwater di faunal diversity in india uh, globally we can see 1627973 species worldwide and in freshwater we they are having only 1,28,449. coming to the diversity in india in the freshwater it is 9457 so now 
these are the different uh, groups coming to the class insecta fresh water we are having about 4842 species so we can see the different uh, phylums coming to the fresh water faunal diversity like i already told that we are having 4842 species in insecta aquatic insects or the water insects they are those that spend part or whole of their life cycle in water the minor orders like columbola neuroptera lepidoptera and hymenoptera are the minor aquatic orders with very few aquatic species and major orders ephemeroptera udonates lecoptera hemiptera neuroptera coleoptera trichoptera lepidoptera and diptera they are the major orders of the aquatic insects coming to the order coleoptera the name of this taxonomic order coleoptera comes from the greek word coleopteros colea means sheath and tera means wings they are commonly known as beetles and these are one of the largest group of insects so we can see more than 4 lakh described species in this particular order coleoptera they are characterized by the mandibulate mouth parts antennae with 11 or fewer antinomias larvae are worm like four wing four wings are folded into chitinous elytra hind wings are membranous protected under elytra while in the resting stage so globally more than 13000 species have been described the aquatic beetle fauna of india consists of only 776 species belonging to 137 genera and 17 families under three suborders the northern western ghats have been worked out the aquatic beetles were surveyed and documented 66 species and 45 species of aquatic beetles were documented from the state of telangana so we can see the classification of the aquatic beetles here broadly classified into five categories true water beetles false water beetles phytophilus facultative and shore beetles So the true water beetles are the ones which are partly submerged for most of the time in the larval and adult stage, and the false water beetles they are submerged for most of the time, the larval stage, and the adults always predominantly they are terrestrial. Phytophilus are the ones which are living and feeding on the water plants. Facultative are actively submerged or actively dwelling on the water surface for a limited period of time, and the shore beetles they live very close to the water edge during all their developmental stages. so true water beetles and false water beetles they are generally required, regarded as a uh, aquatic beetles many water beetles carry an air bubble these are aquatic adaptations in the coleoptera and generally in the aquatic insects many water beetles carry an air bubble called the elytra cavity underneath their abdomens which provides an air supply and prevents water from getting into the spiracles taking oxygen from surface via breathing tubes which are the aeronustic or use dissolved oxygen with the which are the hydronustic forms others have the surface of their exoskeleton modified to form a plastron or the physical gill which permits direct gas exchange within the water some families of water beetles they have fringed hind legs which are adapted for the swimming coming to the collections here common techniques how we collect it is by using a d frame net or the o frame that is a round frame aquatic nets which are generally used the size of the mesh or the sieve it depends again on the size of the specimen which we want to collect the beetles are less than 1 mm to the largest ones are about 5 cm long the entire mass of macrophytes or shed sediments can also be collected and they can be sorted so these are the different techniques in which we collect the aquatic beetles and uh, we sort them out coming to the preservation the collected insects are immediately preserved in 70% ethyl alcohol and later carefully sorted counted and placed in separate vials the vials are then labeled with all relevant information and identification done by using the relevant keys so these are the different stages of the life cycle of the beetles egg larva pupa and the adult and adults have the chewing mouth parts and the larva are having the undeveloped eyes 
Now, coming this order Coleoptera, it can be broadly classified into Adiphaga and Polyphaga. Aquatic Coleoptera, they can be classified into Adiphaga and Polyphaga. Adiphaga are regarded as a truly aquatic, and Polyphaga is the largest suborder of the Coleoptera. Now, these can be distinguished like if the hind coaxia divide the first visible abdominal sterni, the specimen belongs to Adiphaga. And if the hind coaxia do not completely divide the first visible sterni, the specimen belongs to the polyphagia. So now in Adiphaga, we can see the four families which are predominant in India and polyphagia, another four families which are predominant in Indian wetlands. So in Adiphaga, we are having the Gyrinidae, Haliplidae, Dipicidae, Notoridae, Polyphagia, Hydrophilidae, Elmidae, Dryopidae, and Hydrinidae. So this is again a family-wise distribution of the worldwide genera and Indian and also it is compared with the Telangana, the place, the area of the work which we have started. So we can see the Gyrinidae worldwide it is 25, 5 in India and 3 from Telangana. Now the number of species if you are seeing we are having 1000 species worldwide, 73 in India and 5 reported from Telangana. Halipridae, 220 from world and India it is 10, Telangana 2. So these are the different uh, family-wise distribution which has been mentioned here. I'll just continue. The Hydrophilidae also we can see that worldwide it is 2,835 species but in India we can only explore about 212 species. So likewise there are different families, 17 very important families of beetles what aquatic beetles. So this is the biogeographical distribution of aquatic beetles in India. So all the areas, you can just see that the majority of them, they are present in the Deccan Peninsula region and Himalayan region with about 357 species reported from the Himalayas and 193 uh, species reported from the Deccan Peninsula region. Each of the aquatic beetle families, the majority of them, they belongs to Dytisidae, Hydrophilidae and Gyrinidae. So these are the important eight families of aquatic coleoptera. So we can see in the world why 13,000 have been uh, reported in number of species throughout India, it is 776. Out of this, 644 species belong to these eight families and other miscellaneous families, it is 132. So this is again uh, just a representation of the number of species. That was the world and this is the Indian aquatic beetle fauna, family with number of species. To Adiphaga and Polyphaga, the beetle identification, it requires you to become more familiar with antennal shapes, tarsi, mouth parts, labial and maxillary pulps, ventral characters and other morphological characters. Size and color of the specimen will not usually help you to identify the beetle families unless you are already familiar with the morphological characters and that identify the each family. So this is just a key which we have prepared for the identification of the aquatic beetles from different regions of India. Now coming to the first family in the Adiphaga, Gyrinidae, that is commonly known as the Verglic beetles. They got their name from the circular swimming motions of the adults. Adults, they have the compound knots divided and appearing to have two pairs of eyes which are believed to enable them to see both above and below the water. Antennae clapped, mid and hind legs paddle like. So this is the distinguished character of this family Gyrinidae. They usually swim on the surface of water with, if undisturbed, they swim underwater when threatened. The larvae are found underwater and among the aquatic vegetation while adults are generally observed on the surface. The size of the larvae varies from 60 to 30 mm and adults from 3 to 18. Gyrinidae, 1000 species under 25 genera. The Indian fauna is represented by 73 species belonging to 5 genera. Three subfamilies, Gyrinidae and Hydrinae or Ictocalinae. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am, yes. Yeah. Coming to the next, uh, these are some of the examples of Gyrinidae, Dinitus spinosus and Garinus substratus, Garinus distinctus. 
Coming to the second family in the Edifasia, that is the Halipridae, water dwelling beetles, which are commonly termed as the crawling water beetles. Also, the family Halipridae is comparatively very small group. The features that distinguish these beetles from other families are extremely large. Metacausal plates, which cover most of the abdominal ventriles. Size of the larvae it is from uh, five to twelve mm, and adults are two to six. Characteristic larvae. The legs with five segments, one claw at end of each leg. Abdomen is terminating in one to two long filaments. Now, this family Halipridae consists of 220 species under five genera globally. The Indian fauna of this family is represented by 10 species belonging to the genus Haliplus. And the adults of this Haliplus, they are generally long, antennae are long and slender. Elytra is with indentations, legs lined with swimming hairs. So I'll just skip some points because we have to cover the other speakers too. Coming to them, these are some of the examples of Halipridae, Haliplus pulchellus, uh, described from uh, Telangana. Now coming to the Dicidae, the, they are commonly known as predatory beetles or the diving beetles. The streamlined and flattened body of the adults along with the flattened or paddle-like tibia, they give them a characteristic shape to adapt to the aquatic life. They can be distinguished from the beetles in the family Hydrophilidae by the first visible abdominal sternum. And the habitat, it is a standing or slowing, slow flowing waters where there is a lot of vegetation. The larvae size is again 2 to 70 and adults from 2 to 25. The Indian fauna of this family is represented by 254 species belonging to 36 genera. So these are some of the subfamilies reported. Some of the examples of the dietesis which we have collected from different parts of India, Hydaticus, Agarbus species, Platinectis, Laconectis, some of the other examples like Dantarchus and Santocotus mixtus. Some new records from the states of Telangana and Andhra, Copulatus, Socinus and Copulatus Miserensis. Say, uh, some of the new records from Telangana and Andhra Pradesh, Copulatus Indicus, and copulators Neolemi. So these are some of the new records from the Telangana and Andhra. Editors, Cybister Fumators, Hydrovators, Lacophilus elegans, Neptosterners. So these are all the examples of dietesis. Coming to the next family, Notoridae, which belongs to the uh, suborder Edifasia. They are commonly known as the burrowing water beetles. They are closely related to the family Dytisidae. They are mainly distinguished by the presence of a distinct node platform underneath in the form of a plate between the second and third pair of legs. So globally, we can see 258 species belonging to 16 genera. And the Indian fauna is represented by only 16 species belonging to four genera under, under the subfamily Notorinium. So these are some of the examples for this family, Cantheridus, Noterus, Hydrocanthus. Next family in the polyphagia, coming to the polyphagia. Now this is the first family in the polyphagia that is Hydrophilidae. Hydrophilidae family members are commonly known as water scavenger beetles. Globally, there are about 2,835 species belonging to 169 genera. The Indian fauna of the family Hydrophilidae is represented by 212 species. They are notable by the presence of the long maxillary pulps, which are longer than their antennae. Characteristic feature of this particular family, the antennae is very short, mandibles are very large, legs are terminating in a single claw, end of the abdomen generally it is blunt. So common species which are available in Hydrophilidae are Lacobius, Enochrus, Hydrophilus, Tarnolophus, some of the examples you can see here and some of the new records from the states of Telangana and Andhra Pradesh, Sternolophus species, Berosus indicus, Inocris, Lacobius. Some more examples of Hydrophilidae, Hydrophilus olivaceus, Feridium, Dactylosternum. Next family, that is Elmidae in polyphagia. They are commonly known as Riffel beetles. Antennae are usually long and slender with 11 segments. Elytra with rows of indentations. You can see the indentations on the elytra. Legs are very long compared to the body. The size of the body is very small here, but the legs you can see they are very 
big. The body length it is 1.3 to 1.4.7 mm. The almidae are found amongst moss in fast flowing streams. They do not breathe atmospheric oxygen. Many species require waters with high oxygen content. So this you can think, uh, say that this is a, one of the bioindicator species. So the level of oxygen is more they are present in that particular wetlands. After emerging, the adults generally fly for a short period of time before returning to the water. So globally, you can see 1,498 species in 147 genera. And two subfamilies are presented in this uh, family Elmidae. In the Indian fauna, which includes only 24 species. So you can see much difference in the, um, what do you say, like collection or we can say that exploring, we can have a lot of uh, surveys we have to carry out and the research studies have to be carry, uh, carried out to collect these uh, insect groups. So these are the some of the examples which we have seen earlier. Now coming to the next family, Dryopidae. These are also called as long-toed water beetles. Dryopid adults occur in the swift portions of streams and are generally collected under rocks and logs. The adults, they are very small, 5 to 6.5 mm, antennae very short with a pectinate club. This family of beetles is unique because the larvae are generally, generously, generally they are very semi-aquatic, whereas the adults are truly aquatic. Next family in the polyphagia, it is Hydrinidae. These are also called as the moss beetles. Hydrinates are semi-aquatic and occur just above the water line along the streams and other water bodies. Generally, they are found crawling in the marginal vegetation. The size of the larvae it is 1 to 3 mm and the adults they vary from 1 to 2. So similar to the hydrophilates, they are very small, anterior club with five segments, with last segment before the club, it is cub-like, cup-like. Now we have just a uh, I have just given a broad outline on the four families of edifagia and four families of uh, uh, polyphagia, which are generally we have uh, been collecting from the waters of India, fresh waters of India. Now coming to the ecological importance, aquatic collectors, they play a, a very significant role in the aquatic food chain and the food web. They are food for some kind of fishes and aquatic animals. Apart from the aquatic beetles, they also act as a indicators to estimate the quality level of particular water body. Like we said that some of the species are the bio uh, indicator species, which can show you the lake, whether it is a eutrophic or the oligotrophic, the levels, the different levels. They may also be important biological agents for medically important taxa such as mosquitoes and all. Uh, and these beetles are also used to control the water plants that have become pest. Adults of some large cyvester, eritus, and hydrophilus species, they are still a part of the diet of man in China, Thailand, and New Guinea, and uh, some other parts of uh, the world. These riffle beetles, uh, they were gen generally used as seasoning for food in South Africa. This species was also reported to have considerable commercial value. In Hong Kong, cyvester is also used in the aquarium, a formerly widely used practice in Europe as well. Endemicity and gap areas, if you see the aquatic beetles, many of the species are known from the type locations, endemic to Western Ghats and Himalayan regions. The genus like Lactonectus is restricted to fast flowing stream in the hill areas. There exists a gap in research regarding the conservation of freshwater insects as reflected by the less number of publications that specifically focus on the description and identification of the insect species and the conservation. So you can see a lot of gap in the area of research uh, in order to help to overcome this, focusing research on understudied regions should be taken up. Like some of the regions of the Eastern Ghats, it is completely unexplored. We can see uh, part of the Himalayan Western Ghats and the Northeast part has been worked out. But the Deccan Peninsula region the, and the Eastern Ghat, exploring this particular region may result in the new species to science. Increasing the amount of the funding available to the taxonomic research focus on the description and identification of aquatic insect species is also a very important aspect and uh, researchers should be encouraged and motivated to take up this particular study. Bringing awareness among the public essentially uh, students and researchers to focus on the field experiences and direct encounters, it has to be taken up. So coming to the conclusion of this, uh, the taxonomic studies focusing on the less explored families, like uh, we are telling about 17 families in this particular order, aquatic insect, aquatic beetles, but we can see only eight particular families are very predominant. So 
the studies has to be carried out on the less explored families and this will definitely enhance our knowledge on the aquatic beetle fauna of india with lots of new discoveries and new findings it also needs a revisionary work especially at the generic level and researchers should also focus on molecular systematics which can will help in better understanding and difference in the population and evolution so i think integrated taxonomy also has to be taken up along with the morphological studies if we are focusing even on the molecular study we can have a good result so these are some of the references in this uh, beetles uh i am very much thankful to director zoological survey of india for giving me this opportunity to present uh, on aquatic beetles of india and i am also thankful to dr jack manfred curator water beetle curator austria who has been always guiding us in the research work of beetles i am thankful to dr raghunath sir for uh, guiding us in every step and uh, i am thankful to all the officer in charge of all the regional centers who are constantly encouraging the center also to come up with a good number of uh, uh, research activities and if you have any questions please you can mail it to the fbrc webinar or fbrc zsigo.in thank you so much that's over uh so i think now uh, we will go to the next presentation uh i now invite dr devi shankar suman scientist senior scientist diptera section and uh, is officer in charge for diptera section section zsi kolkata and website updation zsi kolkata Dr. Devi Shankar Suman, he is having lot of research interest in the medical and veterinary pests, especially mosquitoes and their interactions, host and environment, identifying and characterizing variants from the species complex, establish their role in disease transmission, and finding effective control measures. Dr. Devi Shankar Suman has published more than fifty national and international publications, and uh, he is also a member of uh, many associations and he has got a grant in aid from northeastern mosquito control association on an unidirectional non insecticidal lethal trap for container mosquito surveillance and control so i request dr devi shankar suman to present for the today's webinar good evening madam good evening all and uh, i am audible sir audible uh let me share my presentation uh, and screen uh, okay so share can you see my slides ma'am no 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 please present the, now like that no you have yeah. to, hmm टॉक as uh, uh, this is a very important topic uh, as many authors already have mentioned so i will focus on dipter now mostly so first of all i would like to tell what this you know chapter will cover there i don't we don't have much time as some speakers have also uh, have their talks so we will talk about diptera general taxonomy evolution importance then their life cycles and how what is their diversity globally or in india what is their ecological services role what is their societal services role and then we will move to the mosquitoes uh, what is their diversity and how the important uh, you know for the larval habitat selection and their development which affects their uh, entire things so uh, we will move on so diptera you know like uh, this is generally two winged insect uh, sometimes confused with some other insect which has two wings but it has horn tails 
this is a specifically dipteral uh, uh, taxonomic characters they are known as the true flies and is one of the most la uh, four largest uh, insect orders which, uh, which contribute around 150000 species and uh, if uh, the wingman said it's no less than one tenth of all species on the earth it's a big thing so it, it found everywhere where you go cold hot mountain sea everywhere it can on fresh water you can find these species in the, some marine also so it is widely distributed in india around 7220 species have been reported belonging to 1300 genera and 92 families morphologically diptera has uh, uh, lots of character which are used uh, which are being used for the taxonomic identification but for there are few important character which can tell you oh this is the diptera like two front wings with the hind wing modified hard tail mouth both parts specialized for sucking or uh, piercing and wing are reduced with venation so you can see the uh, wing has reduced venation this is the character of diptera Why we study diptera? Diptera are fascinating, significant, and well-known insects on the earth because they are harmful as well as useful. They transmit deadly diseases to humans and animals. They are agricultural pests. They create. They don't do uh, disease. Uh, don't, don't transmit uh, diseases or agriculture. They, they are significant biting nuisances. useful they are pollinators they are scavengers they are predators and many more other roles they play in the environment so the diptera you know has two suborders uh, some people consider three suborder but now these there the are two orders nematocera and brachycera they are brachycera orders you know like mosquitoes and some other insects are coming those uh, they have long antenna with the multiple segmented but in brachycerum diptera they called hard diptera evolutionary because they they modified they reduced the you know uh, many things in their body they would according to their needs so their antenna is one of the identification character if you see the short antenna they comes into the brachycera if you see the evolutionary path they are one of the highly evolved insects so if we talk about the diptera life cycle which is important to understand why the dipterans are aquatic and uh, why are some are non aquatic so like you see the half fly it doesn't need water for to complete its life cycle but if you see the mosquitoes and other nematocera insect they needed water exclusively because they cannot complete their life cycle like if you see the mosquito life cycle the eggs the larvae and pupae are the exclusively water they cannot do it anywhere else so water is compulsory but is it okay with these insect to be have the aquatic life cycle or they need to play something so be, being in a restrictive environment they have to modify themselves they have to be adaptively well so they modified their morphology their physiology their behavior for survival they have very good senses to select the perfect habitat because they, if they select the wrong habitat then their protein is gone they have lots of climatological risk for the the temperature rainfall and all and then many other abiotic factors they have to be very cautious for predation rate of consumption selectivity and preference same as for the defense mechanism so they have then the aquatic insects need but especially dipterans need lots of adjustment in their life to be why uh, and be abundant in those uh, uh, habitats so what can be the thing the first thing comes with the respira respiration you know the x if you see the mosquito x if you see the mosquito x there are lots of uh, variety of x in the mosquitoes but the unique thing is they need air to rest air because the algae develops when they lay x out right Similarly, the aquatic species like Norway or the Turkey, or the uh, they 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 need air. Only if, uh, some insect they can take oxygen the diffusion process, but they take aerial oxygen uh, from the environment with the different processes. So this is very important. So if you see the prevalence of families in Diptera, around 150 families are globally known. and out of that 92 are in india 
if we come to the aquatic, almost 50%, more than 50% dipterans are aquatic. So, uh, like around, uh, this author has reported 80,000 species and out of that 46,000 are aquatic. So, dipterans contribute a large number of species to the aquatic habitats. If you come to the Brachycerin families, which has lots, uh, around 40,000 of species, out of that 13,000 are aquatic. Some are like community, which is the vector of retinosomes also. They exclusively get to which cannot survive without water. But if you come to the number of families, you see many of the uh, more water. So, hello, am I audible? Audible, Dr. Suman, continue. Okay, okay. so here the Ceratopoglidae, Chironomidae, Curiosity, Simulidae, they are exclusively uh, aquatic species and the term Nematocera contribute around 70% of the total known species globally as aquatic. If you see the Indian, and uh, like India has 36 families, which is known aquatic out of the 40 families world globally. So India contribute a lot in aquatic dipterans. So, and among in, within India, there are 36 families, which is known out of 92 families. These are the families, and I don't want to tell the name, but uh, as not, we don't have time. The Nematoceran families contributing like 18 families to the out of 25 families in India. Similar, but Brachycerin has less, 18 families out of 67. They are big group. If you see the statewide distribution, you find the West Bengal has majority of families occurrence rather than the others. Other, other state like Assam, there's Himachal Pradesh, Sikkim, and some northeastern states are also well reported with the species. So, aquatic dipterans, if you see this, Nematocera nematos has 91 genera out of 406, but on, the Brachycera has only 60 genera as aquatic. We, by now we know there is aquatic species, but what they do in a, a aquatic uh, environment? So, we can see with equity, they, they play a very important role which helps the ecosystem to sustain. They are called ecosystem engineers. If you see the black 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 fly larvae, which are still producing, they, they and they can adhere the lots of organic material uh, with their body. So somebody calculated that 429 tons of dry mass fecal pellets they can trans, uh, transport daily, which is equal to 6,000 elephant defecating each day, which is a significant. So a service for the any ecosystem and which allows other organisms to grow in that ecosystem. Similarly, the bioperbulators, the chironomid larvae, which can be go at very high density and they work like as our forms work on the earth. They break down the material uh, or complex material into the simpler ones and uh, produce the micronutrients for the others. The scrapers. In ecosystem, scrapers play a very important role to clean the surfaces for others. This bellifacerids can clean a significant amount of surface area with a, with a very less density. Shredders, if you see any bucket or any other organic container or pond where the lots, lots of leaf materials are there, and you will see the small, small, tiny, regular larvae uh, crawling on the leaves. They are helping uh, work as shaders. They, they break down that leaves and uh, turn into the small particles. So, uh, some other are predators, like doc Dr. Ankita was telling about the predators. They are the uh, chow borus larvae. They, they help to clean in big lakes. In Canadian lakes, they are uh, well known. They, they can maintain the, their lake ecosystem. So, so they are the food resources for other organisms. Many insects which cannot survive without insect larvae. They are exclusively mosquito larvae feeder. There is a picture, you can see the fish are eating the mosquito larvae. The people use an aquarium to feed the, the fishes. There are another exclusive, the, like uh, the predator uh, insects and some nematodes which exclusively, you know, uh, uh, use mosquito larvae to, you know, survive there. Mosquitoes are symbionts for pathogens. They can carry virus, bacteria, protogen, and some nematodes without dying. They, 
the parasitoids, some schizomites are well known parasitoids, and some many other insects, dipterian insects, also also parasites and parasitoids. They can they they kill many other organisms. Other than the ecological services, they they are being used for societal services such as bioassessment. Lots of the Environmental Protection Agency in USA used chironomid larvae as a as a standard to assess the water quality. This is well known. Many diphtherians are used for toxicity of heavy metals, chemicals, thermal stress, and uh, using the chromosomal, chromosomal deterioration and organismic level. There is a parasimulium insect, which is used as a forest health indicator. So diptera plays a significant role in societal services. They, some dipterans have a chitinous structure in their uh, larval stage or pupal stage which doesn't degrade in very harsh conditions. And they, these are being used for many paleological studies. Deterrents are used for the biological control, for herbs, for mosquito vectors also. They are used as a bioproducts. Now these days, the people are looking for protein-rich food. So there is a, uh, uh, FAO has recommended the chironomid, culicid, simulid, and tipulidine as a perfect protein, human protein diet. So we don't know the future, but in Thailand, people are using black fly larvae. They are putting some lemon juice and chili paper raws, and they are eating raw, eating raw these larvae. So forensics have also been one of the area where the deterrents used. So we come to the mosquitoes because they are exclusively aquatic. And they are vectors. So, this uh, I would like to give some uh, uh, what we call ideas or the view. so why we should study this is the vector which kills the most of the you know uh, majority of peoples on the earth, rather in comparison to the other vectors. Around more than three thousand five hundred species of mosquitoes known globally. 404, 405 species are known from India. More than 30 are vectors. You can imagine how much, you know, how many type of disease they can transmit. Many vectors can transmit single disease. So they are highly evolved for blood feeding mechanism and their other biological habitats. So they show the great adaptivity in different environments and they cannot complete their life cycle without water. This is the distribution of mosquito fauna, uh, which you know has only two subfamilies, Anophilini and Culicini, and which contribute 50 genera and 404 species. It was the paper of Dr. Tiagi in 2015. So if you see the genus-wise distribution, the Anopheles and the Culus contribute maximum to this uh, uh, the mosquito fauna and both are vectors anopheles are known for the malaria vector some of species transmit filaria also but culex are the uh, can transmit multiple diseases japanese encephalitis and uh, filariasis and some other countries it transmit west nile some species also transmit malaria. The stegomyia, people known as this genus as Aedes. Earlier it was known as Aedes. It, the stegomyia was the subgenus. Uh, sub it uplifted to the genus level. So it is well known for uh, dengue and uh, chikungunya Zika transmission. There are other monsonia has contributed four species to India, which is also a vector. So if you see, if you see the statewide distribution of the species of mosquitoes, so you can see that the Northeast is rich in, uh, in mosquito privilege because of high, humid, and hot climate. And uh, there are South Southern also, like Kerala, is, uh, Kerala, is Maharashtra, and Andaman Nicobar. They are also rich. West Bengal also contributed 73 species. The list is not complete yet. Uh, I'm working on it. So it will number will increase in future. So they are the vectors. If you are among arthropod vector, you see the dipterans are the one of the major uh, group which transmit lots of diseases among the humans and the animals. So 
how they survive, how the aquatic environment is important. We know survive in the aquatic environment. But are this this is okay to have the three stages in it? They they cannot afford simply choosing the wrong habitat because their life cycle, their stages are very particular are particular about their food, their biological and chemical features of the habitat. Like you see the mosquitoes, Aedes mosquitoes, they are both vector egypti and Aedes zerbopictus. They live in containers. They, are, they, are, uh, they, they lay eggs where the water is not flowing, there is no movement, there is no disturbance. You can see the tire and these uh, pots, they are... But in Anopheles, they are different creatures. They like more oxygenated water, they like uh, with the, some green algae or something where they can, their larvae can eat. You, you can see, they can breed anywhere. They can breed in pond, they can breed in agriculture field, they can be, breed in accumulated water, they can breed in river. So their habitat choice is very vast. Not like not that is mosquitoes. If you see the Kulisan mosquitoes, they are different creatures. They like turbid, polluted, highly organic content water. You, if you see this picture, uh, so, this is the uh, adaptability of this, this particular Culex mosquitoes, Culex and mosquitoes, how high density they can go uh, in the particular habitat. Uh, in the mostly, in the evening, people complain that mosquitoes biting, they are mostly Culex. The Mansonia, this is one of the different creatures, uh, which is very beautiful, have bended pattern on entire body, beautiful scales. But it is hard to find their larvae because their adaptation is different in the aquatic habitat. What they do, they use some uh, vegetation and put their siphon inside the vegetation and take the oxygen from uh, air from that vegetation. That doesn't seem like Anopheles or Culex or Aedes larvae in the container or the open surface. So it is very hard to find and sample these species. So these species highly evolved, we know. So you can see these three, uh, the, the X of these three genus, A, D, and of these Culex. What is the common thing? All need air to survive, to develop in the aquatic environment. But they live in different environments. One is in sturdy water, another is flowing water. So how they, how they survive? How, so what they do, they modify, they evolve their oviposition habitat. The A, D, mosquito lay single eggs, but they stick their egg to the, uh, the container surface. They're, they need a sticky uh, surface. That's why they cannot lay eggs in the, uh, the river and in other aquatic habitats. But Anopheles uh, uh, gifted with the air flows. It doesn't need to stick to the surface. It has own air float like boat. It can swim. So it can lay their eggs into the river ions and flowing water. But in Culex, Neither it has a sticky mechanism nor the floating mechanism. So what you know, the QLX learn? They, they put lots of eggs, 100, 150, 200, 300 eggs together. They make a boat. Dr. Boat Suma, uh, yeah, sorry to interfere. I think... Uh, it's finished really this. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. So this is the evolution. Why did they learn how to survive in this environment? So the aquatic habitats are important for the surveillance and management. So there are three stages which you can lots of techniques which uh, uh, for this uh, to manage these vectors. So we know dipterans are the true flies, the true things. They are abundant and they are diverse. They can survive in both aquatic as well as non-aquatic. Most more than fifty percent are need water habitats to complete their life cycle. They are ecologically diverse. They play different roles in the environment. So I would like to thank here uh, Director JSI again, uh, webinar organizers who gave the opportunity, the scientific and technical staff of Dictera section and research scholars. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Sumat. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Sumat, uh, for aquatic dipterans. Now I request uh, Dr. Manpreet Singh. Uh, Dr. Manpreet Singh, yes. yes Dr. Yes, Manpreet Singh is a senior scientist at uh, ZSI Calcutta.
and he is uh, in charge for the miscellaneous insect order section headquarters dr manpreet is working on taxonomy on caddis flies for the last 12 years on the evolution of aquatic insects climate change and role of indicator species especially in the fragile Hima himalayan ecosystem ecology of trichoptera biodiversity conservation bio monitoring of aquatic ecosystems uh, dr manpreet also has described about 100 new species and uh, he is also having the honor of getting the serb young scientist project now i request dr manpreet to present please yes madam yes Help. Is it okay, Dr. Manpri? Just wait, madam. I am yes. present. This one. On this one. It is not giving an option. It is visible, Dr. Manpreet, now. I think you can. Is it visible? Yes, yes, Dr. Manpreet, you can continue. It is visible. Okay. Uh, I know, I think it's... <laughs> I, I would say good evening to all of you. And uh, first of all, I thank Director Zoological Survey, uh, Dr. Kalash Chandra, for providing this opportunity to present uh, my research uh, and share my views regarding the trichoptera diversity in India. Uh, so first of all, when uh, I would start, uh, now Dr. K. G. Sivarama Krishnan has told you about uh, the aquatic insects and others have also told about other, many other aquatic insect orders. But trichoptera, uh, if we go about trichoptera, they their origin and the history basically the trichoptera they are called caddish flies because uh, this uh, name actually originated from the cloth merchants who used to uh, sell or sell their yarn by traveling from one place to another and what they does was that they wore their samples around their body and in a similar fashion, the aquatic larvae of the caddish fly, they also attach whatever the material leaves and the twigs around their cases to make their cases very beautiful. And in some cases, even the molluscan, freshwater molluscan shells are also used uh, in the case, make, case making. So they are called to the underwater architects by the vegans in the 2004 who worked on the biology of the larvae. Now coming to the uh, how the caddish flies have evolved, they evolved about 275 million years ago after the coptera and plecoptera and they belong to suborder Amphiasminoptera. Earlier this Amphiasminoptera is uh, considered as uh, to contain Lepidoptera and Trichoptera, but recent uh, in May Eater, they have added one more fossil insect order from the Burmese uh, amber. The uh, order is called Trichoptera, which has uh, more affinities with the Lepidoptera, be being uh, based on the presence of the scale. But in case of the Trichoptera, as the name suggests, the trichos itself means the uh, hairs, that the wings are covered with the hairs. So they are considered as the sister taxon. And the origin, uh, based on the early fossil record, is about 275 million years ago. I am audible to all of you. Audible? 
हेलो ओके ओके नाउ द एक्चुअल नेम ऑफ द कैडिज फ्लाइज वाज गिवन बाय किरबी इन 1830 एंड इफ वी गो फॉर द जनरल कैरेक्टरिस्टिक्स ऑफ द कैडिज फ्लाई दे आर जनरली ब्राउन ग्रे और टैन कलर एंड ऑल द थ्री फोर स्टेजेस एग लार्वा प्यूपा and the adult occur and that that is why they show complete metamorphosis and their size generally varies from 1.5 mm to 100 mm and they are soft and slender bodied similar to moth yeah when we go into the field how can we recognize them even i was not aware how earlier when i started uh, uh, 10 12 years ago to work on the caddis flies i was all only aware of the lepidoptera and other beetles and other uh, bees and other uh, insect orders but when actually you experience them in the field they, it is the only the sitting posture as you can visualize they their wings they are generally kept at uh, held more obliquely over the vertical plane making a triangle or a tent like shape over their abdomen and the second feature is the antennae they are generally almost equal to the wing length or twice the wing length these are just pictures of the adult carrier flies now coming to the most talked about uh, the carrier fly larvae though i have not worked on the carrier fly larvae but they are most important component of any aquatic ecosystem in the fresh water uh, fresh water because they act as the food for the uh, fish fishes especially the trout fishes and another the another ecological or importance is that they remove the fine particulate organic matter from the water suspensions and along with the ephemeroptera and plecoptera as already told they remove organic uh, and other pollution uh, from the fresh uh, water taxa so any change in their abundance and diversity has been the basis for the utilization in the fresh water biomonitoring and it, uh, to assess the ecological degradation and even the effect of the climate change and in japan they are also considered or marked as minor pest of the rice because in they are produced or emerge in large number and they they feed in the rice fields on the uh, roots of uh, the paddy plants and i forgot to tell uh, on the top uh, right side uh, right side they are also the enthusiast jewelry enthusiast they are attracted by the cases so this artificial jewelry is also based on the carriage fly larval uh, engineering now if we try, consider the trichoptera is seventh most species order after the other uh, main insect orders and is first among the primary aquatic insect order now if we consider uh, or uh, talk about the division the order trichoptera till now was having three suborders but recent morphologically uh, and based on the molecular evidences the third suborder has been merged with the integri palpia as the basal branch so now only two suborders as uh, given by the martino are recognized the anuli palpia with annulated maxillary palp and the integri palpia with non annulated maxillary palp now the larvae of the anuli palpia they make fixed retreats or the they are called finger nets and net spinner because as you see in the picture uh, they make only uh, nets whereas the in uh, integri palpia they make portable cases and they may be free living in case of the portable uh, cases they use different material around and wrap around their body if we see the global perspective at global level 16266 species and 618 genera under 51 families are known from 
all over and they are, are represented all over the globe except the antarctica and one family is also uh, occurring in uh, uh, in case of the australia and the new zealand it is considered as marine only one family and whereas the 10 families and 121 genera and 765 are considered as the fossils if we compare the global perspective with the oriental and india the global uh, oriental region alone contributes about 35 uh, th almost 36 percent whereas the india contributes about eight percent uh, of the global species number and the oriental region though it is a very small uh, region after the uh, only after the australian region uh, it constitutes about th uh, 32 families and the maximum diversity also approximately 400 species per gigameter square occurs only in this region. If we see the Indian perspective, the annually palkia is represented by nine families, 42 genera and 471 uh, species, whereas the uh, integri palkia is represented by 14 uh, families, 41 genera and 540 species and uh, the basal lineage uh, is represented by four families, 12 genera, 285, and uh, con contributing to about more than uh, 1,296 species. And coming to the present scenario, if we compare this uh, with uh, uh, the 1,296 species, about 10% has been contributed by Dr. M. S. Sani, who start, uh, first ever published the checklist from uh, for the Trichopter of India and uh, provided a key in 2001 and later on followed by me and uh, my co-worker, the Siyad Pare. And we have added till date 100, uh, if we consider yesterday's contribution, the last paper, 108 species and 20 more than 34 new records to the India, contributing about 140 species. This is just a general uh, overview of the then integri palpia and the basal lineage, contributing to 1296 species, 95 genera. Now, if we consider the diversity in the biogeographic zone, all, all we can know that 10 biogeographic zones occur in India. So, it is very clear from uh, the table, Himalayas have, is having the maximum number of the species, followed by the Northeast. What could be the evident reason for this? If all we know that Himalaya itself is a biodiversity hotspot and the Northeast being a part of the indo burmi or Indo-Malayan uh, hot, biodiversity hotspot. So they, though their area, even the Himalayas, Himalayan region or the Himalayan, uh, bio, uh, this biogeographic zone constitutes about 6.5% of the total land area and the Northeast only 5.2%. But the species number is more than 900 in this and if we see the comparative account of the families uh, in these uh, different zones of India, it is clear that green bar of the Himalayas with 583 species under 27 uh, families and is followed by the Northeast with 23 families and 406 families. And if you see, there is also a zero number in for the uh, this uh, desert uh, zone. So no species have been reported from there. What are the reasons uh, that such number of species occur in this region is that the geographical location, as I have already told, and the rivers, they are annually flowing and the tributaries provide an ecological niche for the larva of the caddish flies and in spite of this the Indian caddish fly or the trichoptera taxonomy has not been uh, worked out very sincerely but only the some foreign workers or the earlier pioneers they 
contributed to the Indian dry cock crop fauna. These are the just uh, pine pictures showing the pioneer workers starting from Pictet and then R. McLachan, Martino, Navas, Nathan Bank, Mosley. Almost all these four people, Martino and to Mosley, they worked in the Indian Museum and they contributed many species. And the maximum contribution is by this last fellow, the Fernard Schmidt, who uh, dedicated his whole life to the uh, Trichoptera taxonomy and he collected for about 10 years, starting from 1950 to 1960, and then uh, taken that material along with him to a Canadian National uh, Museum or uh, now we call it as Royal Ontario Museum because he was working there and through uh, he contributed about 800 species to the Indian Trichoptera and all those eight uh, type, 800 types they are lying in the Royal Ontario Museum. Now coming to my perspective when I started we were uh, assigned this trichoptera and we know nothing about the carriage flies in the 2008. Only the foreign uh, uh, workers like Dr. John Morse and the uh, late uh, Dr. Uh, Oliver Flint, they helped us with the literature and uh, this apparatus. You can uh, uh, see this was emitting a, a, a portable light ray which was emitting blue light. It was uh, difficult for us to uh, visualize or to stare at this light, but we use this and uh, killed it. Our uh, most of the collection, uh, almost uh, I would say 75% of the collection was collected using these light traps. But before installing these light traps, you have to select the locality, appropriate locality where you will get. Uh, so you have to survey it in the daytime, like the in the right side pictures, it is evident that uh, we surveyed this locality during daytime. So, this is the general method, mercury vapor lamp. The other method, this portable light traps, a wet collection method, and aspirator. And uh, in the last, uh, you can see the melchi trap put on a water stream. This wet collection, we use uh, alcohol 90% or depending upon uh, for the purpose which you are using and the dry collection method. Now coming to the larvae, they, the annually pulpy larvae, they are commonly called net spinner or finger nets depending upon the family to which they belong. They make, uh, they basically consume the non-vascular algae and the diatoms and liverworts. And this is considered as an evolutionary, uh, evolutionary uh, significance because if you see the Ephemeroptera, Plecoptera and uh, some other aquatic insect order, they came early to the Trichoptera. So they have to avoid the competition. So they, um, uh, they adjust according to the conditions. So they use this uh, material for their uh, consumption. Now coming to the integri palpia, they are the basal lineage, they prepare the cases as well as uh, they are free living. So in the case of the first figure, you can see these are the cases, simply simple cases and this one is the enlarged saddle case uh, caddish fly which uses the small pebbles around its body and this one is the Rhycophila larva, which is a free living till the fifth instar, but after that, uh, no, not the till fifth instar, till the fourth instar, and after uh, converting into fifth instar, it also secretes or uh, uh, prepares a small case around its body. In Tigri palpia, the tubular cases, the plant material in case of the planetentoria larva, they usually use the wood of the angiosperm. This is also have a, a, a evolutionary significance because these planetentoria larva, they actually emerged or these integri palpians, they emerged along with the uh, anu, uh, this angiosperms when they uh, first originated or their evolution. So this also uh, helps in uh, to trace the 
uh, evolution or the uh, his evolutionary history of the angiosperms. So, annually palpial larva as well as the integri palpial larva, they use the flying particulate organic matter. But in case of the annually palpial larva, you can see they only prepare these nets and these nets, they are used as filter nets to remove the fine particulate matter. Whereas in case of the annually uh, integri palpia, as you see in this, uh, the laminifilled larva, they use their legs to filter the suspended fine particulate matter uh, with their body parts only. Now coming to the conservation and threats, in the recent reports, as we all know, that there is a decline all over the world. Caddish fly species are also being lost. And on an average, 74% uh, of the trichoptera species inclu included in these reports are on decline and extinct. And uh, here I want to add that uh, in India, we don't have any, this, uh, I, uh, any of the species of the caddish flies uh, that is uh, listed in the red listing or IUCN list. But these lists are only available for the uh, regions, especially the European and the North American region where they have already completed their uh, documentation of the trichoptera fauna. And last but not least, as our uh, director told that even a human body contains 70% water Similarly, if there is a magic on this planet, it is contained only in the water. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Manpreet, for highlighting on the Trichoptera display group. Uh, thank you very much. And the last uh, presentation, it is by Dr. Prabhakaran, Dr. S. Prabhakaran, Senior Scientist at ZSI Hyderabad. Uh, Dr. Prabhakaran, uh, he is working on the Blatoidea, that is a focus and membrane today, order homoptera. Uh, and he has described about four new species and published more than 70 uh, uh, research publications. Sir. Uh, sir also has been awarded by the Loyola Environmental Award okay. and the Entomologist Award. My request Dr. Prabhakran, sir, to continue the presentation. I request okay. Dr. Manpreet, sir, to um, mute the mic. Yes, sir. Yes. Whether audible? Yes, yes audible. Yes. Uh, respected Director, sir, and Joint Director, Dr. Rajnan, sir, and Dr. Deepa, Officer in Charge, FERC, and my dear friends. Today, I would like to present Blattodia diversity in India. You may have one doubt. What is the relationship between cockroaches and the aquatic insects? Yes, some cockroaches having uh, semi-aquatic life that already mentioned by our Dr. Subramanian during his presentation. Now, I would like to present some interesting characters about the cockroaches. The name cockroach has been derived from the Spanish word cucarecha. Cockroaches are the members of the order Blattodia, which includes termites. In recent phylogenetic studies have shown that termites are also derived from cockroaches and their sister group of the cockroach family Cryptosacidae. The taxonomy work of Indian blackheads still now mainly covering on common and easily available cockroaches. Present your PPT. Yes. Now it is visible, madam? Yes, yes, visible. Okay. Yeah, the taxonomy work of Indian practice still now mainly covering on common and easily available cockroaches. In India, having a lot of forest and descriptive cockroaches. There is status of the cockroaches. Cockroaches often seen by the public as pests, but only a few of them are pests from total descriptive cockroaches species from the world. Most of the cockroaches go through their life completely unseen by the public, aided by their cryptic habits and coloration. Then cockroaches, together with termites and mantis, they are members of the polyneopron insect orders. Polyneoprons are grasshoppers, crickets, earwigs, and stick insects. Then this place shows the cockroaches cladogram. Then morphology. Cockroaches are normally dorsoventrally flattened with the body similar to broad oval in shape. The head is dis uh, directed downward, having chewing type of mouthparts. 
Death is partly or completely consumed by a large shield like pronotum. Then cockroaches are fully winged or completely wingless or various stages between those two stages. The four wings are usually hard, sclerotized or leathery texture to cover the hind wings. The hind wings are membranous. The legs are generally cursorial for standing, but in a few species can be for can be fossorial for burrowing in the soil. The abdominal caudal end having anal cerci and varied from prominent to small, sometimes completely hidden. Then here this slide shows some uh, morphological structure of cockroaches. Then color patterns of the cockroaches. Cockroaches are having various color patterns, having various shades of brown pattern, sometimes striking black and white or yellow patterns in the pronotum or in the tegmina. All the nymphs are more or less similar to adult, except for absence of wings in the winged specimen. Cockroaches size may vary from more than an order of magnitude with body lengths, ranging from less than 3 mm to 78 mm. Here this slide shows some patterns, color patterns of cockroaches. Then habit and habitat, sorry, feeding, uh, feeding habitat. Cockroaches occur on every continent except Antarctica but also diverse in tropical and subtropical regions with the highest diversity of species reported in the neotropical region. They occur in all the type of, type of habitats from, this, uh, from desert to semi-aquatic environments, though the highest number of species lives in hot, humid forests. Most of the cockroaches are nocturnal, but with notable exception. Cockroaches mostly all are detrivores and they feed mainly on dead plant matters. Some urban cockroaches like Supala longipalpa and periplant americana, americana are omnivorous. Some species have been observed, they feed mainly on mushrooms, tree sap and mammalian fecal matter, but also on bird feces, flower petals, moss and attempting to feed on a uh, live ant, for example, Parcoplata species. Then reproduction. The most general matter mating behavior of cockroaches is that of after initial courtship, the female mounts the male. The male moves backward to engage the genitalia while underneath is female and the animals subsequently assume, to, assume an end-to-end -end position in which they remain until copulation is completed, uh, which takes 30 minutes to 4 hours. Then another pattern that the animals simply engage end-to-end -end process. This pattern occurs in some blabbered species and some corrugated species, for example, Theria petiviriana. In some blabbered roaches, the male mounts the female before engaging the genitalia and assuming to end-to-end -end position. Here this slide shows some basic type of type 1 courtship and cooperation in cockroaches after initial orientation to potential to mate. Then we move on to Uthika. Most of the cockroaches produce the Uthika, that is egg case, contains two rows of egg, eggs and various shapes and sizes. Most of the cockroaches deposit their uthika shortly after it's, it has been produced. In some roaches, mainly in Blattella species, carry their uthika in the tip of the abdomen until it hatches. In family Blabridae, some species carry their egg uthika inside abdomen until the egg hatches and the limbs emerge from the mother body. A few Blabridae does not produce the uthika but carry the egg mass in that abdomen and the limbs emerges from the mother body, but the eggs are partially covered by membranous uthika. For example, Diploptera punctata. Here this slide shows the, some various types of uthika laid by the cockroaches. Then overview of the taxa. The order Blattoidae is divided into three superfamilies, Blabberoidae, Blattoidae and Goridae. The relationship between the superfamilies are still uncertain, but Blabberoidae and Blattoidae might be a sister group. The Blabberoidea consists of two families, Ectobidae and Blabberidae. The Blattoidea contains the five row cockroaches family, five cockroach family, Blattidae, Anaphylactidae, Cryptosacidae, Lamproblatidae, Trinocidae, and one termite family, Termitidae. Uh, Corididae consists of two families, namely Corididae and Nocticolidae. The classification used here largely follows by cockroach species right by coined uh, by uh, George Beccolini during this 2015. This slide shows the the order and superfamily and family ways of cockroaches. Then the identification of cockroaches. Identification of the cockroaches are very, very difficult. There is no global key, but a family level key provided by Roth 2003, but in, the, in his key is not included some families, namely Lamprobratidae, Trainocidae, and Analpactidae. 
In the Indian practice, some family and genus level keys has been reported by Roth in various literatures, but still some fauna is not having proper keys. In Blatter's Blatter identification, mainly based on the male's morphological characters and genitalia. Here, this slide shows some family wise uh, identified cockroaches. In the worldwide, there are 4,975 cockroaches available. Then, this slide shows the number of known species available in the world. That is, uh, and nine family it belongs to nine families. Then this uh, this uh, this that shows that uh, cockroach is available in the world compared with any in Indian species one from uh, nine uh, nine family. Then the details about the families of cockroaches. The family Corydidae, sorry, super family Corydidae, family Corydidae. The Corydidae includes two sixty one species recorded in worldwide. In India, 18 species so far reported. Many of the species in this family adopted to live in the dry, dry habitat. Hence, these cockroaches are known as sand cockroaches or desert cockroaches. Corridated roaches are sexually epic with the winged and or wingless male and short winged females. For example, Theria petiveriana, which lives in scrub jungles of India, inhabits both human made rubbish mosses and natural humus, humus accumulations, whereas nymphs burrow in loose, humid soil and also this genus endemic to India. This family distributed all over, all over the world except polar regions. Then the slides. Then family Nocticolidae. The Nocticolidae family includes 33 species of species in the world. In India, only three species so far reported. This roach is very small in size when compared to other roaches. That is a, a mini, a more or less five millimeter long in size. Many of the species are cared dwellings. Females are based wingless and males are having complete wings with venation. Uh, this family reported only in Oriental regions, Australian region, and some parts of the Ethiopian regions. Then, superfamily Blabridae, family Ectobidae. The Ectobidae, Ectobidae includes 2,363 species in the world. It occupies approximately half of the total species. In India, 53 species so far reported. This family contains four subfamilies Blatilinidae, Ectobidae, Nectiborinae, and Pseudophilodromine and some of the genera still not assigned to any subfamily. This group, most of the species are living uh, leaf litters. Hence, the members of this family are commonly called as litter cockroaches or wood cockroaches. This family spread all over the world except the polar regions. Then family Blaberidae. The family Blaberidae includes 1,262 species in the world. In India, 83 species so far reported. This family contains uh, 12 subfamilies in the world from this. In India, there are seven subfamilies so far reported. In India, this family is the more dominant family in the order Blatodiae. This Blaberidae family species are very larger in size, hence it is called giant cockroaches. This family also distributed all over the world except polar regions. Interestingly, the thorax postlana carry the nymphs under their wings until second to third mold and also the nymphs are feeding feeding the pink liquid secreted from mothers from 4th, 5th and 6th and 7th dental segments. This is one of the important parental care behavior of, uh, found in these cockroaches. Uh, then Blatoidae, uh, super family Blatoidae, family Blatidae. This Blatidae includes 652 species in the world. In India, 24 species so far reported. This family contains 4 sub subfamilies in the world. The Blatidae includes the well-known pest species Blata orientalis and Periplanta americana. This family also distributed all over the world except polar regions. Here this slide shows some Neostylophyga, Periplanta americana, then uh, Neostylophyga, etc. Then family Lampro Blatidae. The Lampro Blatidae are a small family with 10 species in the world wide. Uh, they mainly feed on rotten wood and dead leaves. The, the family reported only in neotropical regions and so far not reported in Indian region. Then family Trianocidae. Trianocidae is a small family containing 17 species in the world and uh, in India only one species so far re reported. And these are wingless cockroaches and closely related family Lampro Blatidae and Cryptocercidae. They live in the understone or dead and dead wood matters, but still the uh, feeding biology is unknown. This family is found in Australian and Oriental regions. Then family Anaplectidae. The Anaplectidae is the monogenetic family containing 95 species from the worldwide. There is no report in India. These are very small in size and ranging from 3 to 9 millimeter in length with fully winged. 
It lives in leaf litters from rainforest ecosystem. This family reported in neotropical, tropical, Australian, and Oriental regions. Then, finally, the family Cryptosercidae. The Cryptosercidae is also a small family, contains 14 species only from the world. In India, there is no report. This is also monogenetic family and closely related to the sister group Isoptera. Cryptosercus species are long-lived cockroaches. They reach maturity in four to seven years and can live as long as three years as adults in Neoptic and Paleoptic regions. Short. The members of this group have some economic and medical importance. There are a number of records of cockroaches causing damage to plants by eating roots, flowers of the plants. Cockroaches feed upon the bark of trees or fruit or fruits. This is the most often cited species causing massive destruction of tobacco plants. Uh, the importance of cockroaches has let, uh, spectres of vertebrate pathogens in well known. Mainly, the cockroaches play an important role in detectivory pollination used as a medicine, food chain, pest, and other uses also it involved. Then, uh, conservation strategies. The most of the cockroach species are live in the tropical and subtropical forest, forest area. These habitats are under the intense threat from logging and clearing of land area for agriculture, deforestation, urbanization, natural disasters like forest fire and landslide. Large uh, proportions of cockroach species are likely to be under threat or may go on to extinct due to this type of activities. Then if you have any clarification need, please contact the email. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Prabhakaran. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm just seeing in the chat box many messages, the feedback link and all. The link is already, we are just uh, placing it on the chat box. You can uh, add that. And uh, one more thing is, uh, I just want to say that the presentations have been uh, very informative, though it is a lengthy session this time, uh, but we try to cover the ma major insect orders, aquatic insect orders. Hope it is a uh, very informative and useful to all the participants. Uh, now I request our director to conclude the session, sir. Thank you very much, Dr. Uh, Deepa Jaiswal. Uh, at least uh, uh, I've been listening to all the presentation starting from our uh, introductory uh, speech by uh, Professor K.G. Sivaram Krishnan. And I hope uh, Dr. Uh, K. Subramanian is there. Dr. Subramanian. He's left the meeting, I hope. Uh, hmm. So uh, I've listened to all the presentation. Dr. Ankita Gupta is also not there. Even the last two Subramanian days, sir. Subramanian and uh, yeah, yeah. So, Dr. Subramanian, please uh, just uh, take uh, those messages by Dr. Sivaram Krishnan. He has recommended three very, very important points which we have to take up. Uh, and already we are doing this integrated taxonomy uh, uh, as far as the classical taxonomy and uh, molecular study. I've already been taken up and then FBRC also they have started in a very big way. I am hoping that at least 200, 300 sequences they are doing uh, every year. That would be an advantage. The last presentation was by Dr. Prabhakaran. Uh, I've seen all those slides. It was wonderful to see this uh, many species of the cockroaches, which I have never seen in my life. Uh, most of them are from the forest, I think, area. Uh, then Dr. Devi Shankar Suman, uh, the presentation about this or uh, what SEM photographs uh, for the eggs of different uh, genera. It is uh, then Anopheles, then Kilex. Uh, so I don't know for how many species we have this our uh, photograph, and that would be very interesting if all of them are published. Dr. Manpreet Singh Pandey is master on uh, Trichoptera. And his presentation was also very, very good. And our guest from uh, Entomology Research Institute, Loyola College, particularly Father Dr. Maria Pakyam. Thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> so his presentation with regard to locust was very, very interesting. Then followed by uh, Professor P. Venkatesan uh, on the future stock of biodiversity of water bugs. Uh, and together, I think all of the uh, presentation has been very, very important, thought provoking, and uh, all our uh, participation must, must have enjoyed. They will have a lot of takeaway as far as this uh, aquatic insect diversity of India is there. If any 
participant is interested to have maybe any uh, uh, information or the collaboration or they want to have any advisory services from JSI, we are always open to them. We'll be happy to support them. With this, again, I thank uh, Officer in charge, Dr. Deepa Jaswal and her team, Dr. Boni Laska, then Mayor Dr. Prabhakaran, Dr. Uh, Yadav. So, everyone, Yadav. So, thank you all of you for organizing a wonderful uh, national webinar uh, by Freshwater Biological Result Center. Okay, thank you, thank you, and good night to all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, now we will just end the session with a vote of thanks by Dr. Prabhakaran. Any direct question, one or two is there, so I'd be happy to just uh, give the reply. Yes. Any participants, any questions, you can please. Immediate one or two questions, not ma'am, more than that, because I'll need it to 6, 15, 20. Then leave it. More questions, Yes, go, yes, go yes, yes. Thank yes. you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Now, the formally, we'll just end the session by the vote of thanks by Dr. Prabhakaran. Yes. It is audible, brother. Yes. Audible, audible. Please. On behalf of Freshwater Biology Regional Center, Zoological Survey of India, Hyderabad, I propose a hearty vote of thanks. We are indeed grateful to Dr. Kailash Chandra, Director Zatasai from Calcutta, to inaugurate this national webinar and to solicit as effective keynote address. He is at present heading the premier zoological survey of India by the government of India and indeed very kind of him to have accepted this invitation in spite of his various engagements. In his inaugural address, he has highlighted several problems of environmental conservation and restrictive practices and he has provided much intellectual food for thought that our younger generation crave for environmental protection and climate change. I have, sorry, I am sure that sure he has learned an excellent inaugural keynote address will set a tone for our discussions in the different business sessions. Our heartfelt gratitude to Dr. C. Raghunathan, Joint Director for these valuable suggestions and the preparation of the seminar. The present webinar deals with the aquatic entomophonal diversity and the invitees include Professor Dr. K. G. Sivaram Krishnan, Professor Emeritus, Reverend Dr. Maria Pakim, Director Entomology Research in Royal College, Professor Dr. P. Vekadesan, Professor Emeritus, Dr. K. S. Prabhupada, Scientist TV, and Officer in Charge of Southern Regional Centre, Chennai, Dr. Ankita Gupta, Senior Scientist, SPA, Bangalore, Dr. Deepa Jaiswal, Scientist TV, and Officer in Charge, FPRC, ಸಂಸ್ಥೆ <laughs> does not result in the concentration of wealth and economic resources to the common detriment, but also allow the aquatic entomophonals to maintain the diversity with their ecosystem. I am sure this webinar will draw guidelines in this balancing process in the area which the webinar process to cover. Let me thank all the delegates who have responded so well to our invitation to participate in the webinar and for the effective, effective help lent by our research scholars, contract, contractual staff and technical media team etc. Let me thank you all for the associating with the webinar by our presence. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Thank you all the participants, all the thank officers. You thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, thank, you. Thank, thank, thank you. Thank you all the entomologists. Thank you. 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 Yes. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for I think this is a successful webinar conducted by VRC ZSI Hyderabad. Uh, with the support of our director. Thank you so much, all the entomologists of ZSI. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, <laughs> thank you, madam. Congratulations, ma'am. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Dr. Rahul. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you, madam. Excuse me, ma'am. Yeah, any question is there now? Ma'am, can you please uh, send these PPTs in the WhatsApp group? 
Yeah, we will definitely share all the PPTs in the group. Okay, thank you, ma'am. After submission of your feedback form, e-certificate will also send. Along with that, we'll also send you the PPT of all the speakers. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hello?